Hello and welcome to Giant Mess, an extra sloppy sports and entertainment talk show about the New York Giants, Mets, movies, TV, comedy, and a whole lot more. It's hosted by a giant mess. That's me, the real cinch, Neil Lynch. I am a overweight, husky, hairy, Irish, Italian, American, graduated from a Catholic high school, but is not Catholic. And I also went to a college known for producing doctors and lacrosse players. And then I became neither because I hate money and I don't like women. Instead, I'm a savage, ratchet, bougie, average. You can reach me via voicemail or text at 862-BIT-1986, 862-BIT-1986. Subscribe to me on YouTube. Just go to youtube.com slash Neil Lynch, youtube.com slash Real Cinch, or search for Giant Mess. Go to my blog, neillynch.com. Go to facebook.com slash Giant Mess, Real Cinch on Twitter and Instagram. And you can subscribe to me on whichever platform, podcast platform you enjoy, pretty much. If there's one out there, I'd be shocked if I'm not on it. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google whatever the hell they're calling Google this day, these days. On today's episode, we're going to talk about, oh boy, just all kinds of shit. The Giants have fired, Joe Judge has fired Mark Colombo, offensive line coach, Robbie Cano, suspended for PEDs for the entirety of 2021, forfeiting his, his very extravagant salary. Talk about how uh, we were robbed but not really robbed. I'll get into details on that. Reviews of Save Yourselves and also of Black Box. And a little bit of this, a little bit of that. So let's get into it. Let's get started, y'all. Life, ain't she a bitch? Uh, Bree is still home from school, which means I can't can't do anything that I want to do, which I know most parents are like, duh, that's obvious you should know that by now your hopes and dreams crushed anything that you want to do you can't be selfish anymore everything you do is for the baby for the baby for the baby for the family for the baby so we've been watching i mean way way too much tv you know i'm trying to break it up here and there but like watching tv two hours feels like five minutes playing with my daughter for five minutes feels like two hours (laughs) I don't know why why that's happening with the space-time continuum, but it needs to stop. We need to tinker with the space-time continuum to figure out how to avoid that because I play with her and I feel like it's we played all damn day and I look up and it's 15 minutes. Like, come on. Watching a lot of Paw Patrol, it's, it's that song is just ingrained in my head. It's ingrained. And what's standing out to me is that uh, – there's never like a puppy revolution, you know? There's never like a puppy work stoppage or strike, which I believe there should be. Um, you know, you think about income inequality and the wage gap. Not to make light of it, but these pups are saving lives. They've saved that mare, both mares, probably a million times by now. And what do they get as compensation? Pup treats. Oh, we get a little pup treats. It seems like an abuse, an abuse for sure. So PETA, like, where are you at, dude? (laughs) I mean, come on. Also, Ryder just, like, ordering them to do whatever. It's like, Ryder, I got a feel for Ryder, though. Like, he's, he, the only calls he gets, it's never anyone checking in. It's never like, hey, Ryder, how you been, bud? What's your day like? Your stress okay? Anxiety? No, it's always the mayor or that Captain Trubo, whatever the hell his name is, that has like alliteration problems. It's like, Ryder, need your help. And it's just like, yeah, I'm doing fine. How are you? You know, a friend in need is a pest. PJ Masks, we're trying to mix that in a little bit as well. Uh, Like I said with PJ Masks, it's just like shit goes down in the day. Crimes are happening during the day. And they're like, but they 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 put their fists into the middle and then they say, into the night to save the day. And then there's like a time lapse to the night. So they have to wait. So crimes could be going up, 
going on like nonstop during the day, but they're no, they only can attack it at night. They can only battle crime, fight crime at night. So if you're Romeo, if you're Luna girl, if you're any of those people, just fucking go hog wild during the day and just hole up somewhere at night. Motel six somewhere. Get off the grid, my man. Seems very easy to defeat the PJ masks in my opinion. And then we're watching Peppa Pig. My God, if you want to slip into the calm of a nap or just have an early bedtime, slip on some Peppa Pigs. Oh, my God. It's just so soothing. Whereas Paw Patrol is like, go, 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 go. PJ Masks is like, don't sleep. Fight crime during the night when you're supposed to be sleeping. Peppa Pig is like, hello, we're going to see Grandma, Grammy and Grandpa, and they're going to bake cookies, and then we're going to drink some milk, and then we're going to listen to stories. It's just like, <laughs> it's it, it just Peppa Pig just laying your head down to, to, to rest. Simply stunning. Um, whew, man, last Friday the 13th, it was a scary one. But uh, we stayed up t- till four in the morning. Yeah. Who says we, st- we still don't, we still, we still got it. We still got it. Okay. Still got it. I had uh, two to three stiff cocks, a little teats and sewed. And then we mixed in some Bud Light Platinum Seltzers and Kona Island Brewery Hard Seltzers. Because we're trying to be on a budget. Trying not to, we're trying to keep the, the booze spending, kind of wrangle it in a little bit. And Bud Light Platinum, you know, we, we like the hard seltzers, but like the the no, high noons get a little pricey. I think the Trulies and White Claws can be on the pricey side, but the Bud Light Platinum seltzers and the Kona Island Brewery hard seltzers, especially when you order a bottle of Tito's, just fit it fit right in to our budget. Problem is, it's fucking heartburn city. Yeah, just like volcanic activity all throughout the SOF. Uh, that's short or esophagus, the soft. Um, so yeah, Sunday was like, I tried drinking again and it just wasn't working. It was just one of those things where it's like, you put a li- just a drip, just goes, a drip falls. And as soon as it hits any kind of like it will just like, it's like Mentos and Diet Coke. It's just a bad reaction all throughout. And uh, your my body's just like, no, you idiot. You, I'm sending up flares through your tract. Your GI tract. There's flares coming out. We need emergency help, and we need first responders on the scene. And you're sending your more gasoline on the fire, you fucking idiot. So yeah, took it easy Saturday night, but Friday we got after it. Um, and of course, the baby woke up at like 8 a.m. the next morning, and I, I was on baby duty, um, and was still drunk. Yeah, still drunk. Not like blackout drunk, but still like you know when you wake up and you're like, oh. I'm not hungover. Great. Oh, I'm still drunk. So the hangover's coming and I'm going to be awake for the hangover. That transition, it's like an eclipse, you know, a lunar solar eclipse. You go from like drunk to the drunk phase to hungover phase. That is like, you don't want to be awake for that. And uh, that's exactly what happened. So I ate like leftover Southwestern chicken egg rolls and short rib quesadillas for breakfast. That's where we were at Saturday morning. It was, uh, no bueno. So why were we up to four in the morning on, on Friday? Great question. It's because the baby just is in a sleep regression, which I guess I'm in a, I'm in a breathing regression. Try not to breathe anymore. Holy shit. Wow. I'm not even drinking booze. This is a, I'm trying to hydrate. So the baby doesn't take naps. She's down for a nap right now. It's like three o'clock on a Thursday. She is, uh, do you want to take a nap? No. She says no to everything, so I don't think that's fair. But uh, it's funny when, <laughs> when she actually does want something I'm asking, she so automatically no that she'll go, no, y- yes. It's just like she... It's like she short circuits. Brain does not compute. Like she can't, she's so resistant to saying yes that if, if she ha- has something that she does want, she has to fight her automatic response and her canned response. 
but I finally got her down for a nap today because she basically fell asleep on top of me on the couch. <laughs> she fell asleep on the couch the other day. And it's just like, that's just what, how we handle naps now. It's just like, you want to take a nap? No. Okay. I'm going to wait until you actually can't function anymore. And then I'll carry you to your bed. <laughs> that's how we're going to do things. Great. Anyway. So getting her down on Friday night was just a struggle because she's not being as active here as she is at the daycare center. The daycare center, they had her doing fucking art, science, math, you know, trigonometry, geography, like all the difference, dancing, playing, you know, everything. And here it's just like, I just plop her down on the couch. I'm trying to limit how much screen time she gets, but the screen time just, it just neutralizes her. And the moment it stops neutralizing her, okay, I turn it off, and then I try to play with stuff. The problem is playing with toys, she's very selfish. And I know this happens with all toddlers. Mine, 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 possession, which is insane to me because it's like that's all they learn at school. That's all we teachers take turns and share. Take turns and share. How about you take turns and then you share? How about that? And uh, it's just, nope, no thanks. And I'm like, you're not going to have any friends if you don't share. And I've thought about that statement and I was like, hmm, it's actually not true. There's plenty of people who just don't share at all. Billionaires, <laughs> for one. Although Uncle Steve Cohen, he's a share. He's for the players. So not all billionaires. Normalize billionaires. Huh? Um, but yeah, I was like, you're not going to have any friends if you don't share. Like it's puff, puff, give. Brielle, remember that when you're in a circle and there's smoke. <laughs> it's not puff, puff, take. Okay. Uh, oh boy. So, you know, didn't get her down, get it, didn't get her down to sleep until like 10, 10 30. And, and it was like, I, we read her, you, know, you get the bath going. So that's supposed to like calm her down. We had soothing, chill pop on Spotify, that playlist going. And then you have like read her a thousand books and then sang her a thousand songs. And it was still like, no. So I think eventually, I don't know if this happened Friday or maybe it happened Saturday. We just took the mattress out of the crib. That's right. The crib, RIP, RIP, RIP. The crib is donezo. The mattress, the first night we put it on the floor. So she's sleeping on the mattress on the floor. And it's like she's completely changed woman when it comes to bedtime. It's like, and eventually we took the rail off the crib. So now it converts into a toddler bed. And so now the mattress is in the toddler bed instead of a crib. But it's amazing the mindset shift that happens there because she's like, oh, I'm a big girl now. Like it just hits her like, okay, now I'm running with the big boys. Just went from a girl to a woman. All right. This, you know, period's going to be piece of cake. <laughs> so, <laughs> but the naps are just not coming. We we just have to wait until she just conks out. Just like, it's just ooh, powers down. So, you know, finally get her down 10, 10, 30. And then there's that, that half an hour to an hour period where it's like, you know, trying to watch a movie with your significant other is just like, it's just fucking impossible these days. It's just impossible. So I was just, I was like, I, Hey, I'm going to rent this because you have decision fatigue because work is killing you. And, uh, I'm not great at making selections but i've done a lot of research in my downtime <laughs> to avoid situations like this so we're gonna watch this so we watch save yourselves and then uh that wrapped up around probably 12 12 30 in the morning and we're like mm, not tired because we haven't had enough us time it was just like all focused on the kid which happens it's like you don't have enough you time you feel like you need to do more or want more that you can do without the kid <sighs> and so we watched a bunch of snl monologues <laughs> Like Dave Chappelle, Bill Burr, John Mulaney, Issa Rae, Chris Rock, and Adele, which Adele looks completely, almost completely different now. Um, she almost looks kind of like Katy Perry a little bit, but uh, then we got in, then it morphed into like an Adele jam session where I'm like, Sapphire of the Rain is her number one. She's like, no, oh, hello. And I was like, you put on Sapphire of the Rain. And, yeah, so late night debate, <laughs> late night debate on Adele jams. And then, uh, yeah, I actually, I'm getting into the cooking spirit, making a lot more baking, creating, cooking, trying to do that, trying to emphasize, but like, it's going to be the winter of the slow cooker. That thing is, is just so nice to use. 
You dump in your proteins, you dump in your sauce, you set it, and you fucking forget it. And uh, three, four, four hours later, boom, you got a whole meal and it tastes phenomenal because it's slow cooked. That's what, uh, that's what the Italians say. I think they say. I mean, that's what my great-grandmother used to say. It's like, it takes time. It takes time. You can't rush it. You can't rush perfection. It's like, ah, 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 okay. Great, great. And so I made some honey barbecue garlic chicken. Yeah. Threw a bunch of chicken breasts in there. Sweet baby rays. Sauce is the boss. Dump that in there. Throw in some chicken broth. Mix that around. I didn't need to put in garlic, extra garlic, because the Montreal steak seasoning, I threw that in there. That has garlic in it, but I put in the extra garlic, so maybe that contributed to Heartburn City. I don't know. But came out, and and by the time the third hour or second hour comes around, it's soft enough that you can just kind of break it up and shred it in the slow cooker. And then it was just, it's been, and then you have like barbecue shredded chicken for the rest of your week. We've been making quesadillas, sandwiches. I mean, I just had a fucking burrito. So good. I did it again. It's like, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. You know, I'm sure we'll get tired of it, but like this is the week of the honey barbecue garlic chicken. And then uh, I baked banana bread. <laughs> yeah, your boy is a baker. Not a touchdown maker, but a baker. And it's surprisingly easy. Yeah, a lot of this stuff, it sounds intimidating. But if you have all the ingredients and you don't have to go out to the store, like if you have all the ingredients or you have substitutes for the ingredients, it's like fairly, you just mix it all together, throw it in a pan, throw it in the oven. Boom. You know, just make sure you don't fuck up the the ratios. Now, the substitutes can be a bit of an issue. Like for this banana bread, I threw in some chocolate chips because why not? And we didn't really have three of the the brown bananas because you're supposed to let it brown, brown, brown as much as possible. Cause we give, we, that's all that our daughter does. Like you, na, 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 na. Yeah. A banana. Okay. She peels it and she'd be like, ah, so happy. She's got a full on adult sized banana and she'll take a bite and then throw it on the counter and walk away. It's just like, uh, can they make mini bananas? <laughs> so we have all these leftover bananas that she doesn't eat. And let them brown. So there's a little less than three. You're supposed to be three. Throw that in there. But we didn't have any butter. So we've been using coconut oil. We didn't have any grease for the pan. So we used coconut oil. And I think the problem with coconut oil is it just like, it just dries everything out too quickly. Like the banana bread came out pretty decent. It's not bad. But I like, you know, I'm going to drop the M word. So cover your earmuffs if you got them. Moist. I like it moist. Sorry. Everyone who's offended. I like it moist. I'm a moist guy. Soggy, sopping wet. I just, I like liquids. Bathe me in moist. <laughs> I like to soak. Um, shout out BYU. But yeah, it's, it's a little on the dry side, but it's still the chocolate chips. You can't really taste the banana, but it's, it's good. You, if you put like a little, Maybe the frosting on it. I don't know. If you threw a little something else on it, we have some pumpkin butter. Maybe throw that on there. I put some pumpkin spice in. Fuck it. Instead of like brown sugar or dark brown sugar, I used coconut sugar, which is apparently a thing. So I don't know if that affected how dry it is. But so far the wife likes it and that's all I care about. Uh, yeah, so monday i my mom has been get got me like eight days it was like hanukkah for me for my birthday last week my mom got me so many fucking gifts and she got me this shirt that if you're watching the video best of 1980 mixtape see if i get and the two more shirts one was like vintage 1980 original parts and i was like that's not entirely true <laughs> and then i got um something about founded in 1980 authentic or something like that so original parts i actually have a cadaver's acl in my left knee so i'm not all original i know i know you feel duped and you should and i apologize uh i'm not 100 percent real y'all it's not 100 percent me so you want to cancel cancel i'm already canceled so <laughs> ain't no thing um sunday i did get to sleep in a bit which is nice and uh, made some chocolate chip banana protein pancakes. If you're noticing a theme here, 
I'm big on peanut butter, chocolate, and banana. You throw those three together, I'm basically, I'm going to take it every time. That's my earth, wind, and fire. That's my Brandon Jacobs, Ahmed Bradshaw, Derek Ward. You know, that's my, that's my trio right there. The Holy Trinity. Chocolate chips, bananas, protein. Uh, no, not protein, dude. Peanut butter. I didn't mix any peanut butter in here. Although, I guess I probably should have, but it was great. It was amazing. I've been wanting to make protein pancakes for as long as I've been seeing Cassandra. <laughs> so it's been, yeah, like seven years. Yeah, we've we've been together seven years. And I've got an itch. No, stop that. Um, and then we, we celebrated the Giants win over the Eagles with some uh, COVID testing. Got tested for the old COVID. Uh because <coughs> Bree had a, because I have a cough, <laughs> if you didn't pick that up in your ear, earbuds. And Bree has uh, had a little bit of a runny nose, which is a symptom, which, by the way, fucking everything apparently is a coronavirus symptom. So it's like, if you have any symptoms, it's like, well, Everything is a symptom. Memory loss? I lose memories all the time. Rash? Bria has a rash. You know, it's just like all this, all this shit that just doesn't coincide with any other sickness. Like other sicknesses, you have two or three symptoms. This one was like, if you have any of the above, and then there's, it's like the end of a fucking uh, OTC drug commercial where it's like symptoms, side effects may include. Just a fucking laundry list combined with a Chinese menu. Um, but my mom, so my mom, after the the COVID testing, I finally caved in because I, I opened this gift from my mom and on, on FaceTime and I hold it up to her and she goes, can you guess what it is? And I was like, I have, uh, hmm, it kind of looks like you would put a margarita glass on it and you put, so it's like to put the salt on the rim of your margarita glass. She's like, no. I'm like, okay, well, these are kind of pokey and sharp. This right here. <sighs> Do you scrape like the bottom of your boot, like to knock something off your boot after you've been outside? Cause it's going to get snowy. It's going to get messy. She's like, mm, sort of. And I'm like, okay, so scrape, scrape, scrape. That's part of it. And so we couldn't figure it out last weekend. And then Monday I was like, I caved in and I decided to do a Google search. I'm like, I'm just going to describe this blue cone scrape. And of course it came up. It's a ice scraper for your car to scrape the ice off your car. Why a cone? I'm not really sure. So I go, oh, it's, it's an ice scraper. And she goes, I know, isn't it funny? A cone? Exclamation point. And I was like, she's like, I just thought it was funny. I saw a video about how it didn't work and thought it would be a riot to send it to you and have you try and figure out what it is. I'm going, yeah, you might have a spending problem. <laughs> you shouldn't have to spend that kind of money to get a laugh out of us or to get a laugh, uh, get a laugh. Like her sense of humor is twisted. You think mine's bad? She got me a, a blue cone ice scraper, two of them. And then she sent me a video of a guy reviewing the blue cone ice scraper. And in the review, the ice scraper doesn't work. We have an ice scraper, by the way, in each car. And they work okay. The scrapers we have in the car work 10 times better than the blue cone ice scraper she just got us. And so I was thinking to myself, like, what if we just didn't bring this up to her again? And we just tried to use this? What if we got rid of our other ice scrapers? We're like, we don't need those old ice scrapers anymore. We got these new fangled ice scrapers. <laughs> just my mom is the devil. <coughs> And I'm, you know, I'm talking about baking and cooking. I made portobello mushroom pizza. Now, if you're like, you think you have an idea of what that is, you're wrong. It's where you cut off the stem on the mushroom, flip it, cut off the stem. You put the, you cover it in oil, throw it in the oven, oh, put some salt and pepper on, throw it in the oven, take it out after five, 10 minutes. 10 minutes seems too long because it looked like it, it looked like someone, you know, the, the, uh, the Joker pre Joker, like the dude who became the Joker when he fell in the vat of acid. That's what it looked like. And then he put on the, the sauce and the cheese and 
oregano, red pepper flakes. I think you hold off on the basil until after. But we, I put on some olives, and we didn't have tomato sauce, marinara pizza sauce, so I put on salsa, you know? A little remix. And it came out great. It was just a little, like, when you first see it, after that first 10-minute period, you're like, this is supposed to be a pizza. Ooh. But it came out all right. And then we come to Wednesday. If you want to talk about a week, Wednesday was a fucking day. And um, I had fully intended to record on Wednesday night. And it did not happen because there was uh, too much to process for the brain. And I think my brain just shut down at 9 o'clock. Right after I put the kid, the kid down to, to slumber, uh, my brain was just like, I know you want to do this, but no. You, you need to, you need to vegetate, my man. So, uh, Wednesday morning, Brie and I on the couch watching TV like we always do. We got to knock on the door. I'm like, okay, no one knocks on our door. Come and knock on our door. Uh, open it up and it's the cops. And I'm like, oh my God, what happened now? These cops have now been to our apartment multiple times. <laughs> one time because it was uh, a death threat from a Mexican cartel (laughs) and then now this guy's like hey did you know that your garage door is open and that your car door is open and I went no because the last time and this is Wednesday the last time that we used the Mazda was Sunday to go get tested for COVID which by the way that was kind of uh you want to talk about anxiety because I got tested for COVID in May when I, when it, my, I had all the symptoms, you know, you name it, I got it, check the box. And, uh, that was like, you know, it looked like it, out of a friggin' Spielberg apocalypse movie, like a line of cars and these people in hazmat suits and scientists and, you know, computers and all this other shit. And they jammed like a fucking jousting stick a pugil pugilist whatever the fuck that's called all the way up my head through my nostril into my brain and it hurt like hell for 10 seconds and i'm like when we went to go tested for covid on sunday i was like are they gonna do that to brielle like granted they won't need a long q-tip but they'll need they'll need like a normal q-tip but at the same time they're not gonna like touch her brain or anything like she's gonna fucking flip out and and never want to see a doctor again As it stands currently, she doesn't want to see doctors anyway. Like, we got in that room. So the wait was pretty long. I want to say like an hour. And we were like, they they said, uh, we check in. Of course, Cass like checked in wrong somehow. I don't know how. And so they're like, okay, you can go wait in your car. And here you go to this website. We'll we'll text you a link to the website. You click on the web, you click on that link, you go to the website. And we'll have the waiting list. And it will show you you know, where you are, you know, when you're going to be up next, like where you are in line. And we were down like 9, 10, 11 or something in line. So we kept che- checking and refreshing like every five, 10 minutes. And then the third or fourth time we checked, it was just like, we're gone. We're not on the list anymore. We're like, whoa, did we just get like leapfrogged? And I'm thinking to myself, well, there's, so they had two different categories. One was website and one was walk-in. We were considered walk-in because we walked in without an appointment. And then we made, you know, the appointment on site as a walk-in, but there are all these websites. And so I'm thinking, did all these people like make appointments on the website and then somehow were able to leapfrog us? Kind of like, you know, when you order food through the app and you were to pick up, you can just skip the line and like go to the front and pick up your shit. Like, is that how that's working? We got Jersey Mike's system going on here. And so she, uh, Cass goes in and they're like, oh yeah, just come back or or you can come in now. So we come in and we're like, hey, you told us to come in and we're like, uh, and, and so, um, then, oh no. So then we go in and we're like, the two front desk ladies are helping some other people. So we're like, do we just go right back? Cause I've seen a bunch of people just walk right back into the back and eventually like get, get a phone call after I'm like flipping out, like Jesus Christ, what the hell's going on? And they're like, Hey, are you, are you in your car? Like, no, we're, no, we're here. And they're like, Oh, you're in your car. It's like, no. We're in, oh, you're out front? I was like, yes. And she's like, okay, I'll come get you. And so I'm like, okay, hang up. Another five minutes go by. I'm just like, 
what is happening right now. <laughs> I'm about to get stabbed in the brain and I, I don't want to put this off anymore. Stab me in the brain and get it over with. And so uh, we all go back. And as soon as we get into that little room, exam room, Bria's like, because ah, ah, she knows she's had so many goddamn shots in our first two years of existence. She's like, every trip I take to this fucking place, I get stabbed. <laughs> I'm getting stabbed every time I'm here. Why do we keep coming back? I don't like getting stabbed. And you keep bringing me back. What did I do? I'm sorry I don't nap. Okay? I'm sorry I go, I'm not go to bed at my bedtime. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I throw. I'm sorry I hit. I'm sorry I kick. All right? Just no more stabbing. So, and it turns out, no, it's just a simple swab of the nostril. Nothing too bad. Thank God. It was still, you know, I had to hold my daughter's head straight as they're doing it. And I was just like, this is gotta, this is gonna have some resonance. It's gonna be some residue from this one. Yeah, gonna be some scarring. There just has to be when you're that young and going through a fucking pandemic. I can't imagine all the children that are going through this right now. Like the the ones that are forming memories that like, hey, I'm just forming memories and oh, this is the world. We all wear masks, got it. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, okay, six feet. Yeah, I mean, that's just life, right? <laughs> totally normal. Um, so that was COVID testing. <coughs> and uh, so then, when, yeah, so Wednesday. Knock on the door from the cops. Wow, we got real sidetracked there. Holy smackaroni. So the last, that's, oh, that's right. The last time I used the car was for the COVID testing. The Mazda in the driveway. The Ford is parked uh, in the cul-de-sac visitor spot because our garage is chock full with shit. We took all our stuff out of the storage unit because it was costing us too much. It's now all in the garage. It's all messy. I'm supposed to organize it, and I have no. I don't, I don't even know where to start. And so the cop's like, did you leave your garage door open? I was like, I don't think so, no. And he's like, did you leave your car door open? And I was like, I don't, wait, what? Like, I don't remember us leaving the car door open, but... If you, I don't think I did uh, an episode on this, but when I had my 10 year reunion for high school two years ago, we, we I got so royally effed at that freaking reunion that, and my wife was also in a, in a bad head space because it was like she just had the baby and was kind of like, you know, just in a fog really. So she had come back. She apparently had come back. And I had helped, you know, she had come into the door. We went to sleep that night. I woke up the next morning to go to work. And the front door, the car door on the passenger side was just wide open. And so I was like, oh, my God, someone broke into the car. And so, you know, I had opened the sliding glass door to see the open car door, run to, sm to, to close the car door, curse my wife for not closing the car door, and immediately got in my car to go to the work. Well, by doing that, I had not closed the sliding glass door and the cats got out and then it was all hell broke loose. <laughs> so I was like, there's a possibility that my wife did not close the door because that's just what she does. But I also do it too. And then um, the cop was like, you want to come out and take a look? And I was like in my t-shirt and like sweatpants, no, so no socks or shoes. And I just immediately started walking out and he's like, it's a little cold out. You might want to put on some shoes, maybe a jacket, a hat. <laughs> I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, I mean, that's how, like, that's how fucking quarantined we are. We don't even know what to do when we go outside anymore. It's like, it's cold out. It was like that scene from Step Brothers where he's just like, do I wash my, can I wash my clothes in the dishwasher? Like, what do I do when it rains outside, you know? So, uh. You know, I eventually I like bundle up and I and I go outside and it's like, oh, and he's like, yeah, I mean, it looks like someone has been rummaging through your car. And, uh, you know, I don't know, has any been anything been taken from your garage? And I was like, uh, I don't know. And then they're like, do you have, and I was like, we have another car right there. And he's like, yeah, that car door is also open. And it also looks like they've been rummaging through it, like the glove compartment is open in both cars. The center console is open in both cars. And so, but I'm not allowed to like go in the cars because it's an active crime scene. I think they mentioned at one point that the guy had been caught shortly thereafter somewhere in some other car, something like that. So, you know, they're just following up on that, I guess. 
I don't know if, I don't even know if they got a call from someone in the complex or what, but I mean, as I said before, the neighbor right next to us had his like Jeep compass stolen and gone for a joyride. They got the car back. I think they caught the guy. I don't know. Maybe not. Um, but apparently according to the cop, like this happens all the time. Like they just hit up complexes. That's just like their thing. Cause it's like, you can just go and hit up a bunch of cars cause they're right close together. And if anyone hears a noise, they just assume it's their neighbor. And I was like, uh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Cause I had finished watching black box, I guess, Tuesday night around midnight ish. I go up to, to bed. My wife's still up and both her and I are laying in bed and we're like, can't shut our brains off. So we're on our smartphones, you know, lights on. And it's probably around a little before 1230. And we hear the garage door. And my wife was like, oh, that's weird. And she's like, must be the next door neighbor, meaning like the guy next to us. Cause he's like either an in-law school or a lawyer or something like that. And so, you know, burning the midnight oil, cashing in, you know, that hourly rate. And no, it was our garage door. And like, we just couldn't put two and two together. Like we looked at on this Nanit app, baby monitor app that we have. And in her room, in Bree's room, which is right over the garage, it was fucking cold. And we're like, should we turn off the heat? Like it's real cold in her room. And that only happens when our garage door is open. Again, it's just not clicking. It's too late at night. We're burnt out. We're dealing with the baby all day. She was working all day. It's just like your brains are fried. So you're not thinking. But yeah, that's when they hit us between 12 and 1230, which seems a little early to be committing that kind of crime. <laughs> like not everyone's asleep at that time. You know, maybe they didn't adjust their clock for daylight savings. You know, they didn't fall back or whatever. But holy shit. And the fact that our door, well, our garage door, like the door that leads from our house into the garage was unlocked. So they could have very easily, because they were able to get into our Mazda, the garage door opener is in the Mazda, boop, click that, garage door opens. They could have come through the garage because there's still a path. It's not like completely unwalkable. And then they could have just entered through that door. But our saving grace is our laziness, or at least my laziness, because you know, we get a lot of packages and... What happens is I open the packages, I take the boxes, and I put them, instead of just taking them and putting them into the recycling in the garage, I just put it by the door in front of the door <laughs> that leads to the garage. So our theory is that they probably might have tried to come in, but they when they opened the door, it hit the boxes and made a little noise, and that, boom, sent them scattering. They're like, now it's making too much noise, they're going to be up. So my laziness actually saved our lives. You're welcome. <laughs> but, uh... Yeah. Nothing is missing from our cars because we don't really keep anything of value. It's just amazing that they broke into both cars and their garage didn't take a thing because we don't have anything. I know people heard my birthday story from last week in Philly and think, oh, these fucking one percenters, elitist piece of shit. We, you know, they, they opened the Mazda and they opened the Ford and they saw a baby seat and all kinds of baby shit, baby stroller. The uh, uh, pack and play. <laughs> they open my car, car seat, baby toys. They open the garage and they just see baby toys and baby shit everywhere. It's like they could have taken our snowblower. <laughs> I don't know what that the street value is on a snowblower, but they could have taken that. And they probably saw how much of a fucking mess it is. So can you imagine? Like I got a list of things that I needed to do this week. If I had actually organized the garage, how easy it would have been for them to to rip us off and steal shit. The fact that I left it messy was a deterrent. <laughs> See, I do have a, a plan. There's a method to my madness. My sloppiness has now officially kept us safe and kept our things here. <laughs> oh boy. Yeah, so that's life. What a Wednesday. What a Wednesday. Our neighbor's funny though. Uh, our neighbor on the other side, because she came out when I was kind of just cleaning things up. Eventually, the detective came and I was like, "We have not used that Ford since November first. It's like a train car that we don't use because we don't go to the train anymore, and so there's no reason why that should be open or like whatever. We haven't used this car since Sunday." And he's like taking notes, and uh, 
And then they all packed up and took off. And so I took out the recycling. And our neighbor, who has a sign in her front lawn that says, we support law enforcement, apparently waited for the cops to leave to come out and get in her car and like pull out. And I was like, hey, what's going on? Like, can, can you believe this shit? And she's like, yeah, what the hell happened? And I was just like, yeah, our cars got hit up. A garage was open. Garage door was open. You know, uh, it's just insane. It happened all like a little bit after midnight before 1230. And she's like, yeah, I was up at that time and I didn't hear anything. And she has a dog that goes ape. I mean, ham. Whenever anyone gets even remotely close to her front door. Just nonstop. And it's like, oh, hey, dog, where were you on this? Where were you this time? Where were you this time? Needed you. And you let us down. Also, on top of that, well, so the neighbor, to finish with the neighbor port, port, that port, uh, she's like, yeah, I just, I couldn't come out here while they were out here. I just know too many of them. And I was like, you, you have a sign that says we support law enforcement in your, I thought you support law enforcement. So I think the theory, at least in my own head, is that she is, she is fond of officers <laughs> and maybe, you know. She's, she's, you know, she's lived in this town for a while. I'd say her entire life. And most of the cops are people who have grown up in this town. So I'm thinking there's some history there, a little hookup history there with her and uh, some officers. And uh, those cops, they like to gab, you know. But still, you can come out and say hi, it's fine. I thought it was funny. She was also wearing sandals, and I was like, uh, I can't believe you're wearing sandals right now. It's freezing. I know I just I know I just tried to exit my house in in no shoes and a t-shirt, but that's crazy. And she was like, Oh, I'm gonna pedicure. And I was like, Whoa, I never thought about that. Like pedicures in the winter. What the fuck do you do? You ladies, tough sons of bitches. And then the last part, I'll wrap this up. What what the fuck with these thieves, these carjackers? What what's happening here? The Mazda has an alarm system. The Ford has an alarm system. And I was like, how did the alarms not go off when they broke into the cars? And the neighbor was like, well, it's because they probably have devices that can disable the alarm system so that they they, they can crack open the car and get in. And I'm thinking to myself, if they have that technology to crack open a car without the alarm going off, how do they not steal the car? <laughs> Why wouldn't they steal the car? Is it because they saw like the child seats? I'm, I'm convinced that these are like robbers with hearts of gold. <laughs> I think it's a robber with a heart of gold, basically. I think a robber comes in and they have a code of ethics, right? They have their code and they say to themselves, they open shit up and they're like, ah, car seat, you can't do it. Their parents, you can't do it. They open up the garage. Ah, you yeah, got the baby's toys. You can't do it. Can't do it. That's one theory. And the other theory is like, if they have a device to crack open the car, why not steal the car? What are you looking for value in the car? Who leaves valuable shit in their car? I guess sunglasses. My mom goes, oh, they're probably looking for money or drugs. And I was like, all right. Second and thirdly and fourthly of all, who the hell is put just has drugs in their car? Recipe for disaster. So who knows? Who knows what they wanted? Maybe they were sending us a sign, but for the record now, Mexican cartel death threat, severed rabbit head on porch, break and attempt. So this area, very interesting. This complex is just like teeming with possibilities of crime. Meanwhile, we, um, meanwhile, we we invited crime to our house in Wayne. I mean, like I said, left the car door open to the Mazda all night, one night. Left the barn door to the basement and the basement door open for like two days in a row. <laughs> you know, we just left everything open. And no one would come in. No one would do anything. Because it's the burbs, I guess. And it's like people, people are more, like you can't just walk, randomly walk into from house to house trying to rob shit, you know, unless it's like a home alone situation where it's like you do, you do your prep work, 
dress up like a cop and uh, ask the family, hey, you got any plans for the holidays? Yeah, so that's that. I'm sure there are like two years, three years down the road, they'll be like, hey, where's the um, where's the plunger? <laughs> like it's just like something random will have been taken. It's almost like the John Mulaney bit from his stand-up comedy act where he's like, we went to a party as teens and uh, this one, like this one kid confessed to me that he would take one picture, f- like picture from a bedroom of each house party that he went to because like the people would, would never, would be, it's, would be something that they would miss forever or something like some sadistic shit. It's like maybe these robbers are on that kind of tip but tell Maloon season lock your doors hide your kids hide your wife so that's life <laughs> holy shit uh been watching some hoops on netflix love that show um it's just like doesn't give a fuck and uh i could listen to jake johnson like lose his shit on loop every day all day for the rest of my life and i'd be happy um so good uh all right so that's tv (laughs) that's my recommendation for tv watch hoops okay on netflix jake johnson about the son of a former pro basketball player who becomes a high school basketball coach he's separated from his wife and he's kind of trying to get back together with her but the wife is dating one of his best friends and yeah it's just a a good a good old time. <sighs> Holy moly. All right, so let's talk movies. We have uh, Save Yourselves, which I mentioned. Rated R, hour 33 minutes. Sci-fi comedy came out on streaming services, I believe, October 2nd of this year, 2020. The synopsis, a young Brooklyn couple heads to an upstate cabin to unplug from their phones and reconnect with each other, blissfully unaware of their surroundings. They are left to their own devices as the planet falls under attack. It's directed by Alex Houston Fisher and Eleanor Wilson, also written by Alex Houston Fisher and Eleanor Wilson. They don't have any really major big-time credits to speak of, but it feels like this is, you know, we've talked about a couple of movies where it just feels like a great stepping stone to something bigger and, and just better. Not that to say that this was bad, but like with a little more budget, who knows where it could have gone. So like The Vast of Night is another one that comes to mind. Um, there was another one that we reviewed that I thought was going to be like, okay, this is very promising feature debut. They've got a bright future ahead. And I think you could say the same for this, this duo, uh, Alex Fisher and Eleanor Wilson. Uh, the cast, Sunita Mani, so not a household name, but you would recognize the face. She plays Sue in this movie. She was arty and glow because the whole time I'm looking at her, I'm like, I'm like, e- e- that's how my brain works. I see a face that I rec- somewhat recognize and I can't focus on any of the dialogue, anything until I figure out where this, where's this person from? Like we've been watching Bolt. The, the, the baby is into Bolt now. That movie from 2008 where John Travolta plays like a, a dog that plays a super dog who whatever. And he encounters the three pigeons in New York and the, and the pigeons are like, ah, this is going to kill me. I'm trying to remember where he's from. And then like the bus with the Bolt advertisement on the side pulls up behind Bolt and they like still can't figure it out. Another bus with a Bolt advertisement. <laughs> That's fine. That's like me like looking at Sue for the first like half hour of this movie and then eventually it's like i gotta like i gotta shake this off because i'm missing key key plot points so she was rt and glow she was trenton and mr robot she's in those geico commercials where it's like the sign guy at home and she's like the girlfriend i guess maybe the roommate i don't know maybe they're not romantically involved she was in a uh, search party which i i watched a few episodes of that on tbs and uh I don't know. Maybe I have to give it another shot. She was also in The Good Place and uh, the music video for Turn Down for What? One of my favorite songs and music videos of all time. You can, wherever you put that on, I don't care if I'm at a fucking funeral. I'm getting 
jiggy with it. She had a great performance. John Reynolds as Jack. He's in Stranger Things, Search Party, Miracle Workers, and High Maintenance. Uh, ben Sinclair is Raph. He, you also remember my remember him from High Maintenance, it's that show about the uh, the the weed dealer who uh, in I guess Brooklyn. It was originally on Vimeo, and then it went to HBO. And then you have a bunch of other people. I mean, I'm not going to get into it. Although Amy Sedaris, Sedaris plays Jack's mom, which is, it's just her voice. So you don't get to see her, but I was like, that voice sounds familiar. And then that took me out of the movie for another five, 10 minutes. <laughs> um, the critics consensus from Rotten Tomatoes, save yourselves doesn't do anything unexpected with its one joke premise. But fortunately that one joke turns out to be consistently funny anyway. And I remember reading that initially and I was like, I don't know if I'm in the mood for like one joke told a million different ways. And even though I understand what they're saying with that sentiment, it didn't feel that way. It didn't feel repetitive or monotonous. Like, okay, you said that already. Okay. You said that already. It really didn't feel that way. So I think that the way that they pulled it off, I don't know that it was just a one note, one joke type movie. Cause in my mind, I was thinking, are all the jokes going to revolve around the aliens? Because as you find out, spoiler, the aliens are like these poof-like creatures. I mean, it's in the trailer, so it's like I'm not spoiling anything. So I'm like, oh, is that going to be the fucking joke? That they just, these terrifying aliens are like these cute poofs? Is that the joke? And it turns out, no, that's not the joke. It's mostly a joke about, I guess you would say millennials, but like the uh, one of the you know the youngerish generations that are now getting older and now trying to transition from post college life into marriage and kids and you know responsibility, house, car, all that stuff, and um, which is a little more. I mean, you're talking about an entire generation. I don't think that's one joke. I think there's a plenty of jokes that can be made at their expense. Uh, I am, I guess I'm an elder millennial because like the, there's like this two year crossover period, maybe like two to four year crossover period between generation X and millennials. And I'm like right in the sweet spot. So it all depends on who you're shitting on. If you're shitting on Gen X, I'm an elder millennial. If you're <laughs> shitting on millennials, I'm just, I'm a young generation X. So, but yeah, I did not, I did not get that sense at all. Like, oh, they're telling this joke again. There are plenty of movies that do that, and it's just like, wow, this is the entire movie. But no, I didn't get that from this. 87% of critics gave it a favorable rating with a 6.7 out of 10 average rating. Hmm. 60% of the audience gave it a favorable review with a 3.52 out of 5 rating. So, yeah, I'd, I'd throw it right, right in the middle of that. Like, in the 70s, I'd say, for sure. And I think a lot of people just had problems with the pacing so the cons i guess we'll, we'll talk about the cons the pacing maybe a little slow for their taste considering you know it is advertised as kind of a end of the world apocalyptic alien invasion movie and that's how it's marketed but that's more of a plot driver it's the impetus for the two character two leads um jack and sue to grow Really, I mean, it's it's just a plot device. It's not it's nothing more than that. I mean, it's just it's trying to get them to out of their comfort zone and to be more open and vulnerable and transparent. And it's more of a rom com relationship movie than it is, you know, this end of the world apocalypse survival movie. So, if, I mean, maybe the trailer didn't do a good enough job of doing that, and maybe people felt betrayed because they were like, "I want an alien invasion movie. That's funny," and it's like. Yeah, this was, but you know, it was more about coming to terms with adulthood, maturity, your shortcomings, knowing that you know a lot of what you were told maybe when you were a kid is not entirely true, and what you expected yourself to be, you're falling short of, you know, that kind of thing. I'm not speaking out of personal <laughs> thing, so. What do the critics have to say? Just as their search for authenticity is about to turn into a Reddit relationships post, a bunch of murderous poofball aliens descend on Earth and Jack and Sue unexpectedly find the meaning and connection they seek in their own fight for survival. Yeah, that's a, that's a pretty good synopsis. Maybe if they threw that on there, people would have been a little more, not less betrayed, 
where, you know, there'd be less, uh, more audience retention. We're talking about YouTube. It's all about meeting expectations, setting expectations and meeting expectations. Um, I personally liked the low budget nature of things. You know, sometimes it's, you get with a lot of an alien invasion movies, it's there's, there's this pressure to like make the aliens look realistic and make the attacks look realistic and make everything try and look realistic. And this felt real, realer than a lot of, you know, alien invasion movies that I can think of because it's like, yeah, they were just completely disconnected from everyone. You know, they didn't, they turned off their phones. They were not watching TV. They just were really trying to connect with each other. And of course, when they do that, that's when all hell breaks loose. And so how did they, it was clever how they were finding out or how they found out the planet was under attack. It was basically like, okay, um, Sue eventually caves and we, there's like a million missed texts and voicemails and it's all communicating what's happening. And I thought that was such a clever way of doing it as opposed to, you know, what we've seen in a war of the world and all the other movies where it's like, we actually see the attacks, but I know people, that's what gets a lot of people off. You know, that's what, <laughs> that's what fulfills their bloodlust. Uh, Manny and Reynolds, the two leads, two lead actors, are an excellent on-screen couple that you want to spend time with. Absolutely, I I, I picked up on their chemistry. And at one moment, at one part, my wife is like, "This is us," and she wasn't talking about the show on NBC. She was like, "This is us," like this right here. This is us. And I was like, "Yeah, we need to talk." <laughs> uh, Another critic said, there's, there's only one joke in Save Yourselves. This hapless generation is doomed, but the survival comedy is delightful from start to apocalypse. Ah, so clever. Yeah, I mean, I identified with Jack in a lot of ways. He was talking about how he's trying to learn how to be a man, but there's, there's when you know, at least when I was growing up, there's this idea, concept of masculinity, and, like, I have not fulfilled that by any means, by any stretch, like, not good with my hands, don't build things like construction wise. Um, I like, I enjoy, you know, the blue collar lifestyle, but I wouldn't call, I don't know if I would call myself blue collar, but I, I do identify or relate. I don't know. But the, you know, he's saying how his dad was like Mr. Machismo, macho man, kind of Randy Savage. And his brothers were very into like this, like, all things male, which I'm not saying I wasn't, I was, but in terms of like changing a tire and, you know, DIY bullshit where it's like, you know, you're fixing things around the house. I just, I'm not wired that way. And I don't think my dad was wired that way either. I think it was like, you know, my dad was more prone to like, let's just watch, let's just watch football. <laughs> I was like, all right, yeah, I'm good with that. You don't have to show me how to fish. Fishing, fuck. I'll just go to the market, get some sushi. <laughs> so, yeah. I identify with Jack on that. And then, you know, Sue, I think Cass identified with her just because it was like, there's this, there's probably this burning desire to, to connect. And if you're not connecting the way you are, like you start to uh, entertain these listicles you find on the internet. Like all these articles that you read, trying to find answers online, and then you try to implement that into your life. I feel like that hit home. Uh, one critic said the inform... Uh, so now we're getting into trivia. This is the trivia section of the review. Information about the poofs is intentionally withheld as the writers thought it was more realistic for people to know very little about the invading aliens what we do know is a little more than speculation. And I thought that was excellent. That's awesome. Cause there's always that one scene ex expository scene where it's like, this is what they look like. And this is how you kill them and this and this and this. And it's just so like laid out for you that it feels a little too convenient. Whereas this, it's like, these are just poofs. Um, they're like attracted to booze and alcohol, um, which they're able to put together on their own, which I thought was nice. Like, okay, the whiskey's gone. Our gasoline is gone. This sourdough reduction, whatever thing that he was trying to pull off is gone, which I guess yeast is like alcohol, right? 
Oh, what was her? Yeah, what our friend said. Yeast, alcohol is yeast shitting out sugar. <sighs> I mean, yum, yum, yum. Get in my tum. Uh, and then there's some spoiler trivia. So you can fast forward a little bit if you want. When Jack reaches to touch the pod in the woods, baby Jack does also. This was not in the script. The baby just did it on his own. I mean, yeah. The baby is also played by triplets, which uh, I never understood. Like, how do you get your baby into acting? I can understand like your six or seven year old is like, I want to act. And it's like, all right, we'll give it a shot. The baby though? Like, how does the baby know? Like if you have, tw- I guess if you have twins or triplets, you just get a call or like an email from Hollywood being like, hey, <laughs> a lot of money to be made off those, those twins, those triplets, those quintuplets, those, those identicals you got going on there. I assume, I don't know. I'd love to know more about that, but I also would not love to know more because I'm sure it's not very, uh, doesn't put them in a good light. According to the directors, the ending is a response to a frustration with other alien invasion movies. Usually the humans figure out everything about the aliens and defeat them, but this ending especially leaves them with very few answers. The directors felt this was more realistic. Okay, you know, I get it. The whole open to interpretation thing, you know, so that it continues the discussion, it continues the conversation, like, what happens next? What do you think happens next? Da da da. da. Leaving it open ended like that. Okay, I get it. I mean, and if you want to be honest, they did kind of set it up in the beginning of the movie. And I won't, I won't specifically say how they set up the ending in the beginning, but once you've seen it, maybe you'll recall it and you'll be like, Neil, <laughs> you were right. Um, but yeah, there's also some theories. Uh, so this is a spoiler theory. Ba- Baby Jack apparently has a history that doesn't appear in the film. According to the writers, directors, the people that Jack and Sue find him with are not his parents, but other people that found him earlier. He has been found several times and passed down like a lucky charm. (laughs) I thought that was an interesting take. Yeah, because you look at that kid and you're like, you're too cute to be that kid of those those (laughs) two, that couple. (laughs) Yeah, so that's uh, Save Yourselves. As a thumbs up recommendation from me, nice little date movie because it's uh, even though I'm, I'm assuming that most, you know, I was it was a little bit of a tough sell for my wife because it's like it it comes off as like this big budget action blockbuster from like the poster frame, the thumbnail, and then even the synopsis to a certain degree. But then, you know, you watch the trailer and I think once she realized it was more about relationships, she got a lot more into it. So. A uh, good date movie, I guess you'd say. Let's talk about Black Box. Now, this is one of the three or four Bloomhouse Pictures movies that are available on Amazon Prime. And uh, they were released kind of in time for Halloween, I think. It was more of a Halloween timing for the releases. What's interesting here is, like, I've heard some stuff about The Lie. Now, there's an interesting twist in The Lie, I think. The KFC uh, from Barstool was tweeting about it. I have not, but I ended up, you know, doing what I always do. I was like, all right, I'm not going based on whatever the fuck the IMDb rating is, whatever the hell the stars are on Amazon Prime Video, because to me, I've been burned by that before. Where it's like, holy shit, this has like 500 ratings of four and a half stars, and you watch it and you're like, this is a piece of shit. So I don't go off that. So I went off Rotten Tomatoes and I was like, okay. It's got a fresh rating from critics. That doesn't mean a whole lot, but the audiences do like it. It's not rotten according to audiences. And so when both audience and critics line up on that, I'm like, all right, time to give it a shot. I looked at the other three and it's like one has good from critics. The other one's not rotten. Rotten one was both rotten. I was like, all right, let's just go black box and call it a day. So this is not rated. Hour and 40 minutes long. Horror mystery sci-fi came out October 6th. Synopsis is, after losing his wife and his me- uh, memory in a car accident, a single father undergoes an agonizing experimental treatment that causes him to question who he really is. Ooh. And the cast, I don't know that there are too many names that you would recognize in the cast, uh, but Felicia Rashad 
aka Claire Huxtable from The Cosby Show. Yeah, she's in it. I have not seen Felicia Rashad probably since The Cosby Show ended. And I've been wondering what the hell she's been up to, but apparently she's been doing I checked out her IMDb. She's been she's been staying active. She's also in Creed, which I forgot. I don't know if she's in the first Creed, but she's in Creed 2, and then I guess Creed 3 is in the works, and she'll be in that as well. As Marianne Creed, which, yeah. Yeah, because she was, yeah. Was she in, yeah, she was in the previous Rockies as uh, Apollo's wife, right? Maybe? I don't know. Uh, And you don't recognize this name, but there are two other actors I want to call out. Because, uh, Mamudu Ati butchered it. Uh, plays Nolan, who's like the male lead. He's from The Get Down, Patty Cakes. He was the uh, kind of like emo, heavy metal, alt punk character in Patty Cakes. Have you ever seen that? I, I mean, you don't, that's not, I, I don't know, I wouldn't recommend it. There were some good performances in it, but it's just kind of like, mm, I didn't need to watch it. And then he's going to be in the Jurassic World Dominion sequel, which I don't even know when the hell that's coming out. I think it was supposed to come out this past summer, right? No. Next summer. Uh, Felicia Rashad is Lillian, uh, the doctor. And then Tosin Morahunaf. Oh, boy. Tosin Morahafolo. No way. That's not Morafolo. Morafolo. Nope. Plays Gary, who's Nolan's brother. Uh, Tosin has been in The Shy and Black, Nut, Black Lightning. So, uh, and I guess Mamu, Mamudu Ati was in something else too. He might have been in Flash, something like that. What's interesting about this movie is it's not from Bloomhouse, like, film production company. I thought was interesting. It's from the Bloom House television production unit, even though it's a movie. So my thought was, I guess the thinking there is like, it was supposed to be developed into a, all of these movies that hit Amazon prime were supposed to be like pilots for a series. Maybe. I don't know. It's kind of weird. Uh, the critics consensus from rotten tomatoes, an intriguing debut for writer director, Emmanuel Osul Kafour. Black Box con- compensates for a lack of surprises with strong performances and an emotionally rewarding story. I don't know about lack of surprises. I mean, it kept me guessing for pretty much all the way through two acts. I'll say that. I mean, there was a point where you start to put two and two together, but it's like, if you could have called that in the first act, kudos, my man, kudos. Although looking back, now that I've seen it, that for one of the first scenes, you're like, hmm. If you rewatch it now, you're like, Haha, they were telling us all along. 74% of critics gave it a favorable review with an average rating of 6.4 out of 10. And then the 63% of the audience gave it a favorable review with a 3.6 out of 5 average rating. Oh, boy. I don't know. I like this movie. But I understand there was a lot of criticism around certain aspects of it, which I can, I can see. So I would put it. Yeah. I mean, typical Neil, I split it right down the middle. I think a little bit of a lower rating than save yourselves, but still worth a watch. One critic said there's almost a comatose nature to the film itself. I just wanted to electrify and wake it up. Yeah. And I think a lot of that had to do with the male leads performance his delivery, how he spoke, how he acted. It felt very, uh, I don't know, concussed if is the, is the appropriate word because he actually was like brain dead from the car accident. But, I mean, you even question that at one point in the movie. You're like, is, was this dude even in a car accident? Is this all a dream? I used to read Word Up magazine, you know, that kind of thing. And, yeah, I mean... But like maybe that was intentional because maybe he's trying to act like foggy and out of it because he is fogged and out of it. He's lost his fucking memory. Um, 
so yeah, he is like, he is kind of sleepwalking through life because he shouldn't be alive. He should be, he was brain dead. So it's got to take a toll on you. But I guess these critics, man, they out here hating. It brings some devilish ingenuity to its variations on Memento uh -huh, and other Who Am I thrillers. And it adds to that something more rare, a genuinely emotional potency. I agree with that. I'm a huge fan, a fan of Memento. So I can, I was drawn to that. And, I, and a lot of critics drew comparisons to Memento. They also drew comparisons to Get Out. This movie is like a Get Out clone, except it can't even get that right. It's so boring. And the main character is like a goddamn zombie. Oh, come on now. That's a little harsh. I, you know, I got, I definitely got Get Out vibes when, uh, Nolan is, goes to Dr. Brooks, Felicia Rashad, and is hypnotized. Definitely got Get Out vibes from that. And I was thinking, oh my God, how is this going to play into that? Like, we get to actually see, like in Get Out, when he's hypnotized, we're only get to see that I feel like for a brief amount of time if I'm not mistaken although it was a little bit extended towards the end but this felt like okay if we're gonna go that route maybe we get to see more of what that would have looked like in Get Out uh, this kind of felt like a spiritual successor to, successor to Get Out it's nowhere near as good and doesn't surprise me the way that did but it tells a very good story led by some creepy imagery and really strong acting yeah, I mean, you know, okay, it's not on Get Out's level, but it still kept me tuned in, and I wanted to, see, I wanted to see it through to the end. And the creepy imagery, yeah, I mean, it was mostly just the the fucking thing that crawls out with the bone crunching. I mean, it was just like, dude, the crunching, the bone crunching. Let me tell you about bone crunching. I was walking the other day, the other night, Tuesday night. I was, I was hurriedly walking from the living room to the kitchen and somehow I don't even know how this is possible completely full-on Graham Ganode the corner of the island just like kicked it full force in my bare feet and I was like I, I just broke my foot like I it took me a good 10 minutes to fucking cool down because I was just like it's like that when Peter falls and and bumps his knee and he's holding his D he's like Oh, that was me, except it was my toe. I thought I broke it. It's the worst I've ever stubbed my toe. Next morning, I woke up, and it was just like, it looked like Mike Tyson, you know, had knocked it out. It was just like, oof. It was just the one toe, too. It looked like it was just purple and swollen. It was disgusting. I've taken a picture of it, and I'm tempted to send it out just to see what, <laughs> how many people will un unfollow me. Um But yeah, the bone crunching creature that keeps popping up everywhere. Ooh, it was reminiscent of, I want to say the ring or the grudge. I think it was the ring. I think it was the ring. Um, it has the feel of get out to it for sure. The story itself is interesting enough to keep you intrigued, though the writing lets it down at times. And the bone crunching is a put off after, the, after you figure out what's happening. Okay, there's enough about it to keep you hooked once you've experienced the twist and you'll be pleased you carried on until the end. Facts, hashtag facts. By no means a masterful directorial debut, hmm. but Emmanuel Asil Kafour knows what he's about and does well at his first feature length. Yeah, I mean, I hope he, I'd like to see more from him for sure. I don't think it was that bad. You know, there were there were some moments where it's like, okay, this doesn't feel like a feature film. It feels like it's slowly like regressing or diving back into like B movie ish type area, but it never fully got there. The kid, first of all, his kid, Ava, one way you can put me off on movies like this is to have a kid that is precocious as fuck. And it seems like every movie we have now, there's just a kid who's precocious as fuck. It's like, can we just have a dumb kid for once? Can we just have a stupid kid doing kid stuff and not being, you know, this overly adult-like kid? And I get it. The car accident left her without the mother. 
the mother was kind of like kept them all together and kept the house in tip top shape and the dad has lost his memory. So he's not contributing and he's not making dinner and picking it up. And so she has to become an adult and is forced to grow beyond her years. I get it. But it doesn't mean you have to make her sound like a fucking Harvard professor, dude. She can still act and say things like a kid, but do still do adult things just in a kid way. I just, can you just pump the brakes on that? I just, I get so upset. That happens in commercials a lot where it's like the fucking commercials where it's like, well, you could save 15% and cut. All right, kid. You don't even know what an STD feels like. That was one of my jokes in stand up and it never, never hit. <laughs> and you can see why. So I would say I haven't seen the other Bloomhouse productions. Nocturne, I think it was the other one. The Lie. And there was one more. I think it was like Evil Eye was the third one. It was the other, the other three. The Lie, just because of what everyone's saying is like maybe it's just worth you know watching knowing that's going to suck but it's going to be so ridiculous the twist that it might be worth like <laughs> checking out when you got nothing else to do nocturne and even all evil eye i haven't heard much about but yeah so that's black box give it a shot i fucking lo- i loved it i'll say it i really liked it i won't say i loved it i'm sorry i take it back Ugh. um so that's movies All right, let's talk Giants. Our New York football Giants have done it, folks. They've broken the curse. First win against the Eagles since 2016. And I said it last week. This is a huge game. And if it's a win, it's not just the most important win for Joe Judge or Daniel Jones. This is a big win for the franchise. This, in my mind, not to overstate it or anything, but this is a turning point for the franchise. This was a hurdle that we needed to get over, an obstacle we had to get around if we wanted to get back on the right track. We had to rid ourselves of whatever kind of jinx we were under against the Eagles. And I think now that we've gotten past that, we can exhale a little bit and we can say we can beat anybody. If we can beat this team (laughs) that has repeatedly found ways to come back and beat us when they shouldn't, and a lot of it was our own doing. We didn't have that happen in this game. We managed in it, and there were a couple times, I'm not going to lie, second half where I said, this is where we lose the game. This is where we lose the game. This is where we lose the game. But it didn't happen. So we, we, we did it. We broke the cycle. Shout out, Godsmack. We broke the cycle. And, and I couldn't be happier. It's the happiest I've been in a very long, long time when it comes to the Giants because they're heading in the right direction. And for us, for the fan base, it can't be be overstated how important this win was for us, the fans. Everyone outside of the Giants fan base was just like, oh, another shitty NFC East showdown. For us, we went into it confident. Not cocky, but confident. We stuck it to the Eagles the first time go around, probably should have won that game, but it was yet again coming down to errors, mental mistakes, little things, plays here and there, allowing the Eagles to get back in the game. And this had that feeling that we had in 2016 when we make the goal line stand or we make the play here on third down or, you know, we're just making plays to ensure that we don't lose it. You know, in that second half when the Eagles, they score quickly and it looks like, here we go. Second half collapse yet again. We can't, our offense is going to sputter and our defense is going to allow big plays and here we go again. But it wasn't here we go again. It, they, the buck stops here and the offense responded, which was huge. And the defense responded, which was huge. And we're just, maybe the Eagles are more talented, but... We have a better coach. I know that for a fact because I watched that game and I said to myself, if Doug Peterson had half a brain, they would have won that game. (laughs) A lot of it is on the coach. You know, a lot of it is obviously the players not executing, maybe not giving 110%. I know, I mean, you could just watch the Giants and every single player on that, that roster is giving everything they have to Joe Judge. And that means a lot. It means a lot to the fans who are watching because... You know, 
everyone has counted us out. I counted us out after the 49ers blowout. I said this is you know this is just another lost season, but it's not. This is gonna this is a pivotal season. Even if we don't make the playoffs, which you know, plenty of articles going around that we could go six and ten and make the playoffs, and it's and it's realistic. It's not it's not a joke, and the and people are saying it's gonna lead to like NFL rule changes if that happens. But right now, the rules are the rules are are what they are. So we're gonna take advantage of it. But you know, no one expected us to do much, and the progress we've made, even though, like I said, hasn't been leaps and bounds, has been something to be proud of that we were bottom of the barrel right there with the jets offensively across the board in a lot of rankings. And no, we're not, we're not close. We're not average yet. We're still below average, but every game we take another step towards getting to average. And I said last week, if we can get to average on offense, we're a playoff team. So, and we're trending in the right direction. But you couldn't have asked for a better game from Daniel Jones, from the defense, from Jason Garrett and his play calling, his creativity, the way he was scheming. And you couldn't ask for a better way to enter the bye week because we're going to get a bunch of people back after this bye week. And then we're heading in, heading into Cincinnati and we're going to be fired up because this is the... You know, and I know Joe Judge doesn't believe in momentum. I do believe in momentum. And I believe that we are a threat. That, okay, maybe we don't go nine and seven. We're not going to run the table. But it's not, it would not be surprising to me if we stuck it to these teams and we gutted out a bunch of wins by one, two, three points each. It would not surprise me because this team is playing as a team. And every, I mean, it's it's exactly what Judge, Judge Joe Judge has been telling us since the fucking day he was introduced to us. Complimentary football. Special teams, offense, defense. All playing at the same kind of level. And although offense is not quite there yet to where defense is in terms of output, production, rankings, whatever you want to call it, they're not losing us games anymore. <laughs> they're not. This was Daniel Jones' first win versus an a NFC East opponent other than the Washington football team. He was 0-5 versus Philly and Dallas. It just feels good to get off the schneid, doesn't it? It's just good to get the monkey off your back. Can I give you any more cliches? Not at the moment, but I'm sure I have some stockpiled somewhere in the back. Giants have now scored 20-plus points, 20 or more points in each of their last six games, and they had fewer than 20 points in their first four games. Now, have we faced the same caliber of defense? That's That could be a devil's advocate argument. But the fact that we're putting up more points is is good. Now, can we get to 30 points? Get closer to 30 points each game. And then the defense, we wouldn't have to rely so heavily on the defense. That would be ideal. Uh, as far as team stats go, pretty even in terms of total yards. We had more, about 40 more total yards. Uh, more passing yards. Uh, Philly had more rushing yards, and it's kind of deceiving looking. If you just look at the numbers, how that's possible. We'll get into it in a second, but the Giants have rushed for 100 or more rushing yards in five consecutive games for the first time since 2010. I mean, these are numbers we haven't seen in a long time. This is productivity we have not seen in a long time. 151 yards on the ground which uh, against the pretty staunch Eagles defense, I think they're pretty good against the run. So for us to, to dominate like that is uh, kudos to Joe Judge and not Mark Colombo. We'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, we did allow three sacks again, but the, our, D, our defense did get three sacks. The Giants defense has two or more sacks in each of their first 10 games of a season for the first time since at least 1940, dude. So... Yeah, we don't have an edge guy, a pass rusher, a Khalil Mack, or a, I almost said JPP. Jesus Christ. You know what I'm getting at. We don't have a, a Von Miller or someone like that that can come off the edge and is going to give you, going to have a 20 plus sack season, 15 sack season. We don't have it. 
we don't really have a guy that's going to be our sack guy. We don't have an LT that's going to have the 20 sacks like he had in 86. We just have Patrick Graham, one of the, arguably one of the best defensive coordinators in the league. And we have a bunch of smart guys that know how to execute his schemes. And he's able to get guys free and get clear shots on the quarterback. Hurries, knockdowns, pressures, and sacks. And, you know, Leonard Williams with five sacks now, six sacks, I think, maybe. Bringing guys from the secondary. He's bringing guys from all over the place, and he's able to get sacks. And that's really what all it comes down to. Would you rather pay a guy $20 million a year to get you 15 sacks, or would you rather pay four guys $5 million a year and get you the same level of output? I don't know. I, I just enjoy this team... You know, and this goes back to what happened with Golden Tate. It's team first. Joe Judge has been, I mean, it's a, it's crazy what he said. He's followed through on his vision, and it's the definition of leadership. You have a vision. You lay it out to your to your 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 guys. Help them on the way, and you achieve those goals. And he's doing it. I mean, he's, I mean, I would sign him to, I, I know this is completely premature, and I've been wrong. Everyone's wrong once in a while. I would sign Joe Judge to an extension today, tonight, right now. He's just, he just, he's got it. And I don't think it's going to wear off. Now, he might, uh, he might meet some resistance if we still lose games and we have a losing record in 21. I think you might see some players start to revolt. But when the players put in the effort and they see what happens, they see the fruits of their labor. They see that they're, you know, they should be winning games. Now they are winning games. It's infectious. So I think he is the answer. And like everyone said after this Colombo thing went down, <laughs> the dude is decisive. And that's what you want in a leader. You want someone who's not going to be wishy washy on the fence, hemming and hawing and avoiding conflict and not addressing anything. I mean, this is a guy that. <laughs> He sees something wrong. He tries to address it and fix it. And if it doesn't work, we're on to Cleveland. We're on to Cincinnati, you know? He's he's on to the next guy. So, whew, man, it's this is the best I've felt about the Giants in a, in a long time, since probably 2016. The, uh, I mean, and the biggest number, probably the biggest number of this the game from the team stats section, Philadelphia third down efficiency zero goddamn percent hell yeah dude it, it's like you look at it and you're like whoa you know you watch the game you're like you you watch you seeing the graphics like oh for oh for five oh for nine oh for this and you're like wow like we're really this was a huge pain in our ass for so many weeks early on in the season the inability to get off the field and now to face an eagles team that consistently always found ways to burn us on third down and fourth down and pick up huge first downs when they shouldn't and they didn't and it's the first time in 10 years a Giants opponent did not convert a third down 10 years and meanwhile we converted 35 percent you know not bad not bad at all so that was a major reason why we won this game we own time of possession and we weren't as penalized as much. I mean, the, the the rest were a little flag happy on this one. They had quick trigger. 18 total penalties. Philly had 11 and uh, definitely helped us out a whole bunch of times, you know. So, you know, it's all, it all comes back to discipline. The Seagulls team viewed us as a joke. I think that's a fact. I think the Eagles team was so used to the 17, the 18, the 19 team, and even looking at their first matchup in 20, they thought, that's the same old Giants. They'll make, they might get out to an early lead. They might have the lead late, but they're all, they'll fuck it up, and we'll find a way, and we'll, we'll come out with the win. And I don't think they took us seriously. And I think just talking to the Giants players who were on the field, Logan Ryan, saying, you know, they did not take us seriously. They did not take the game. They were not giving all they had like we were. And this was Daniel Jones' best game. This is the, I would say this is, 
you could say the Buccaneers game was the biggest win of his career, but that came down to a missed field goal. I would say this is the biggest win of his career so far. Now, uh, granted, <laughs> he only has four, but this was the biggest win. Zero interceptions, zero fumbles, no turnovers. Now, did he didn't throw any touchdown passes, but he was 21 to 28, so he has a pretty nice completion percentage, 244 yards. And he didn't hurt us. There was one dropped pick by Nikel Roby Coleman. I guess maybe that it was tipped, so I don't know if they can necessarily put it on Jones, although I think it was a high throw to Golden Tate. But that said, uh, his completion percentage over expected, CPOE, this comes from Justin Penick or Penick of Talking Giants, plus, f- plus 5.6. It's the third highest in the league so far. Uh Of that weekend of NFL action, 75% completions, as we said. His average intended air yards per attempt, 8.3 yards, which is the third highest in the league. And is 8.7 yards per attempt, the best total so far this year. So what does that translate to? I just threw a bunch of numbers at you, and maybe you you got a little foggy in the eyeball area. I'm going to break it down for you, Peter Pan, Count Chocula. So... What it means is he's able to throw the ball deeper, further, harder, stronger, okay? He's looking down the field. He's being more decisive. He's getting rid of it, but he's also, you know, he's able to throw deep and complete it and pick up yards. I mean, Jesus, man. The back-to-back throws he had on that one drive, first to Sterling Shepard, then to Golden Tate, Maybe he doesn't throw that in the first half of the season, first quarter of the season, excuse me, the first four or five games. Maybe he doesn't throw those. You know, the Bucks game, he, he was throwing them, but he wasn't completing them. So it looks like he's coming around. He's finally starting to, he's learning the geometric rate. So uh, I'm just like so happy for the guy, you know. He, he redeemed himself on the touchdown run. That he had 34 yards. He was he topped out at 19.2 miles per hour. And it still does not look like he's running fast. But I don't know what it is, but I think he's just he's just he is Ivan Drago. He just fucking trains his dick off. And he that's when he gets into game mode, it's just like the muscle memory kicks in and all his training kicks in. And it's like when he was running. He wasn't bobbing up and down. He wasn't shifty. It was just so smooth and like mechanical, ergonomic. And he didn't trip and he scored a touchdown. And that it was like redemption on Tosh.0. Oh. Uh, he recorded a QBR of 91.5, highest single Q- Q- game QBR of his career. He was the highest graded player for the Giants from the, from the game with an 84.2 overall. Uh, when he was when operating from a clean pocket, he was 18 of 18 with a 93.1 passing grade. 188 yards in a clean pocket, four big time throws, which was tied for first across the league in week 10. And, and that 93.1 passing grade was tops in the league in week 10. What's the moral of the story? You give the guy a clean pocket, you're going to come up aces. That's how it works. I mean, you you don't get any better than that. So just give the guy a clean pocket. And everyone's saying, and there's a number of factors that are that are impacting this, okay? One is that we found out through this Mark Colombo incident that Joe Judge has paid more attention to the offensive line, what they're doing, what Colombo's teaching them, chiming in more, helping out. That's the that's the word on the street from a lot of beat reporters is that Joe Judge has has honed in on the offensive line and what to do to help. And and this is why Mark Colombo is not with the team anymore. Joe Judge had a relationship with uh this De Guglielmo. <sighs> Wanted to bring him in as a consultant to help out with Colombo. Colombo and DeGuglielmo had a prior relationship when Colombo was a player with the Dolphins, and DeGuglielmo was either the Colts or the Dolphins. And DeGugs was there, and Colombo's a tackle. And 
according to, I forget what source, okay, but I'm no Jason McIntyre. I don't make up shit. Like him saying there was a fist fight when everybody else, unless everyone else is getting paid off by the franchise and the organization, like we'll ban your media pass if you say this happened. Just did not happen. Why Joe Judge would fight a man at 6'8", 330. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't put it past Judge. He's a feisty dude. But at the same time, like, why, Jason McIntyre? Why? But what's weird to me is that I think it was Art Stapleton who said this. That, from NJ.com, that's right. When Colombo was a player, he was in his 11th year as a tackle. DeGuglielmo's, it was DeGuglielmo's last game as offensive line coach. Colombo came up to him and said, you're the best coach I've ever had. I've learned more under you in one year than I have in the previous 10 or 11 years. How do you have that interaction where it seems like this coach has changed your life, changed the way you play, your, play the sport, made you better as a professional? How do you have that interaction? And then when Joe Judge says, hey, we're bringing in the Google Elmo to help you out. I know that you guys have a prior relationship. How do you freak out and call Judge, I'm assuming call them a cunt? I mean, that's kind of the, that's, that's what everyone's been kind of hinting at. So I, what happened there, Colombo? What happened there? Very weird. And how does that, and now that people are saying like, how does that affect Joe Judge's relationship with, with Jason Garrett? Because the, I, I believe the assumption is we would love to have Jason Garrett as the OC. And then Garrett's like, Okay, here's my man Mark Colombo, the O line coach. And Judge was like, eh, okay. But I think DeGuglielmo was also probably a final candidate in the mix there. And Judge probably wanted DeGuglielmo. And Garrett's like, I feel more comfortable with Colombo. Too, too, TLDR, too long, didn't read. The offensive line has improved significantly over the last four or five weeks. Some would say that's due to. Will Hernandez getting COVID and then Shane Lemieux coming in and doing well against the Bucks and then doing well against Washington and doing well against the Eagles. Andrew Thomas is playing better. And some people think that it's because Will Hernandez was out of the lineup and Will Hernandez doesn't communicate as well as Shane Lemieux. And even though PFF tends to grade Will Hernandez better, that just looking at the eye test and looking at what sh- the little things that Shane Lemieux does at the line in terms of communication, in terms of his arm length, his ability to punch and everything else, his nastiness, that he is overall a better fit for the line, even though from, an, from a PFF human subjective number standpoint, he's not, at least in pass protection. Or is it just a, a, fact, ma- a factor, a matter of Joe Judge stepping in and being like, when did you do this, this, and this, and this? You know... But it's uh, that's pretty ballsy of Judge, especially after a win. I mean, it's crazy to think if you, if I come to you and say, "Hey, yeah, the uh, in week after week ten, the Giants are three and seven, okay, and the head coach Joe Judge fires the offensive line coach Mark Colombo." In your head, you're thinking to yourself, "Our offensive line stinks, and they're probably the reason why we're three and seven. And it's like. <laughs> He actually had one of their best performances, you know, 150 plus yards on the ground and, uh, you know, three sacks allowed. Yes, sure. But like not as many pressures, not as many hits, knockdowns, hurries, whatever. So it's, it, I don't know that you have many coaches that are willing to do that to say, you know what, even though this, uh, even though our offensive line is clicking, and even though they just came off one of their best games, and even though this might disrupt the chemistry and might foul us up, you know, I'm going to pull the trigger. This guy showed me disrespect, and I won't have it in my organization. Team first, team first, team first. You know, and in judges' mind, team first means okay, Colombo's going to partner with the Guglielmo. They're going to, they're going to, they're going to get together, bump heads, and try and figure things out. Make things work better so that we don't have three sacks. You can always get better. And that's another that's another judge mantra. You can always improve. You can always get better. So ballsy move. Uh I'm 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 not panicked by it at all. I don't I don't think 
Most Giants fans hate the move. I think they love it. I mean, it sucks for Colombo, obviously. And who knows how it's going to affect Jason Garrett and how he operates, but there's a there's a, Judge had a relationship with De Guglielmo, and everything I've read about this dude is fantastic. He's a former he was a former coach, a graduate assistant for Tom Coughlin at Boston College, I believe, and then he also was a, a Giants coach from 2004 to 2008 when the line offensive line really started to get cooking and just really got. I mean, the 2008 season was one of the best rushing attacks we've ever had. I think it was tops in franchise history. has to be. So I think it's a, I think it's a, you know, I believe in Joe judge. Okay. As prime time would say, I believe in Joe judge. Like I think uh, I, I, there's nothing he's done yet. I wouldn't say nothing, but it was very rare that anything that he's done that I don't feel comfortable with. It's just like, yep, that makes sense. Go with it. Everything he's put out there into the world, he's he's made come to fruition. So I'm uh, I'm bad about it. Uh, Daniel Jones is averaging eight yards per rush. In the last thirty seasons, Michael Vick is the only other NFL quarterback to average better than eight yards per rush. Daniel Jones and Michael Vick, and that was Vick's 2006 season, which he was a monster that season. I think. Nine carries, 64 yards, and a touchdown. Of course, 34 of those yards came on the the touchdown. So he really, the other was like eight for 34, which is, you know, a little over four yards a carry. I don't hate that. But those are the coming kind of numbers that I don't think anyone's going to argue with. If you can get him more than five carries... At least a carry per drive and can get him in that five yard average, at least five yard average. We're doing things right. And Wayne Gallman, the Wayne train, these numbers don't do him justice. 18 carries, 53 yards, and two touchdowns. His rushing average was 2.9, but you got to remember towards the end of the game, Eagles knew he was getting the ball. And so he was getting stuffed, 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 and a lot of uh, negative yard negative yard rushes. So if you, I think if you take those away, it, the numbers look probably a hell of a lot better. There are a lot of runs where, like I've been saying for a very long time, it's just like he gets hit and he just keeps on trucking. It's just like he doesn't look like a big bruising running back, but the guy just doesn't like to go down. It's it's a thing of beauty to watch. I'm so on board the Wayne train. It's insane. Wayne Gallman is the first Giants running back with one or more rushing touchdowns in four consecutive games since Andre Brown in 2012 and 2013. (laughs) Andre Brown. Uh, He gave us... uh, We found love in a hopeless place with Andre Brown. Um, Out of all the running backs with at least 50 carries, Wayne Gallman has spent the least amount of time behind the line of scrimmage per carry. He's also the sixth in NFL's NFL Next Gen Stats efficiency metric. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I would, I would, I would sign him. I would definitely re-sign him. I mean, you can, you see what you, you have at your disposal. He's a, a beautiful Plan B, beautiful insurance package for Saquon. Alfred Morris, eight carries, thirty-four yards. I don't hate that. Four point three average. Darius Slayton, you know, I had my doubts about Darius Slayton coming in this game. He didn't really show up last game. Only one catch, I think. Seven targets, five catches, 93 yards. He had that one beautiful catch down the left sideline deep. And this is where I think Jones is getting better and where the receivers are getting better. Jones is like, hey, don't out throw. I mean, it's it's insane to think that that was a major knock on Daniel Jones coming into the NFL. It was like, does he have the arm strength? And it's like, it seems like he's overthrown Sterling Shepard a bajillion times. Since he's been up. So the fact that he's able to get better ball placement, he's putting a little more air under it, knowing that there's not going to be help over the top. That's huge. You know, you can't, I mean, if you know you have one-on-one locked up and no one's coming, coming across, then yeah, you can, you can at least let the receiver adjust the ball 
And that's what he did on that deep throw to Slayton. Slayton making an, uh, just an incredible adjustment to come around and come down with it. And Sterling Shepard, six targets, six catches, 47 yards. And no, that the yardage doesn't blow you away. But I, I just love the fact that he just doesn't miss. He doesn't drop. He just catches. He's catching everything. Sterling Shepard caught all six of his targets for the, versus the Eagles. He now has a catch percentage of over 80% this season. His previous career high was 70. So, dude's Spider-Man right now. He's just, everything's sticking with him. Golden Tate, he had a nice, uh, a very nice catch down the right sideline after the Sterling Shepard deep ball. Um, Again, like, stellar placement by Daniel Jones. And then uh, for Golden Tate to go up and, and haul it in, I mean, no one's argued that Golden Tate, the, Golden Tate, man, <laughs> he he makes outstanding catches. He'll make one outstanding catch a game. He usually does. He'll usually give you one big play a game, I feel like. But, man, five targets, you'd hope for four catches. You know, it's just, let's get more catches. You know, there was the one pass where uh, Jones threw it way too high and Jones and Tate like tried his best to go up and get it, but couldn't come down with it. There was another ball, though, that was somewhat deep. I want to say it was a dig or cross. And Tate just just gator armed it. He T-Rexed it. And, it, you know, if he if he extends, it's a catch. But he was worried about getting clocked. So something you got to something you got to keep in mind with Golden Tate. The big one, though, is Evan Ingram. Three targets, two catches, 15 yards. And granted, one of those catches was like, holy shit. <laughs> like, <laughs> why is it that the more difficult the catch is, Evan Ingram seems to come away with it, and the, the easier it is, it's like <sighs> complete oppo of what it should be. James Bradbury, I, I don't understand what the Eagles are thinking throwing at James Bradbury. Two passes defended. Uh, no player was targeted more as the nearest defender in the Giants Eagles game than James Bradbury per next gen stats. Six targets in his direction, two completions, 10 yards, two passes defended. <laughs> what the hell? What are you doing? <laughs> like, I mean, the, the formula for success against the Giants is to throw anywhere except towards James Bradbury. And maybe this is just an example of Patrick Graham and what he's cooking up the fact that maybe he's moving James Bradbury around, mixing up the looks. So, you know, the Eagles pre-snap are saying, okay, we're going to throw this side because Bradbury's not on that side, and somehow Bradbury gets on that side. I don't know. I didn't watch the All-22, but it's just like, what? I mean, that third down play he had where Joe Judge broke it down, the Joe Judge report. Third down play, the Eagles run like a rub pick type concept on the right. So the uh, receiver goes to the sticks, cuts in left, the receiver inside of him, kind of does like a mini corner type out pattern trying to get in James Bradbury's way. Bradbury goes around the long way and somehow still comes in front of the receiver and knocks away on the front side, which is just banana land that he was able to do that. And for Wentz to not make that throw when it looks, I mean, you, he paused the film and it was like Bradbury is behind, I think it was Holmes and like trying to get around and like Wentz is looking and looks like he's ready to throw and the receiver looks wide open and within a blink of an eye, Bradbury's around and knocking it away. But again, it's third down. Why are you going against, why are you targeting Bradbury? <laughs> Makes no sense. Isaac Yidem is playing better. He had a pass defended. BJ Hill got his hand up once again. Thank you, BJ Hill. And Darney Holmes coming away with a nice uh, pass defended. Logan Ryan, yet again, leading the, the squad in solo tackles. Uh, Jabril Peppers, six solos, one assist, half a sack, two tackles for loss. I mean, the guy is a maniac right now. If he can stay healthy. I mean, I you know, we'll talk about Pro Bowl players on the Giants squad. And I really think that, look, I know the numbers don't reflect it. If you look at the PFF grades and maybe you look at some other rankings, but it just feels like Logan Ryan and Jabril Peppers are on the precipice of being Pro Bowl players. Devontae Downs didn't have a bad game. I mean, 
there are a couple of times where you watch a run play, you watch a replay and the run play and you're like, dude, you just got blown. I mean, like you're in the stands right now. What are you doing? You getting popcorn? Like he just gets blown off the ball and is nowhere in the vicinity of the play. And, you know, we'll get to the Eagle stats in a bit, but I just, it, it must be David Mayo is just not, you know, he was three solos, one tackle for loss. So maybe he, maybe they're just trying to slowly work him back into the lineup because they know he's not a hundred percent yet, but I don't know that you can have Devonte Downs really as your every down backer, especially on the run, especially in the pass. Like he just can't cover either. Um, and then uh, Dexter Lawrence. So Blake Martinez only four tackles. Not a, not a like particularly great game for Blake, but uh, Dexter Lawrence two solos, a sack, and a tackle for loss. Leonard Williams. You know, if you look at this stat line, it doesn't look like he did much, but I bet you he had a bunch of pressures, knockdowns, hurries, all that good stuff. He did have that personal foul uh, where he threw down once that was more out of frustration, I think. Than anything, can't have that. So that sucked, but I still think he had a pretty decent game. Trent Harris is a name that has emerged. Him and Jabal Sheard. It's just like they just they just signed out of nowhere and are making plays. He he combined with half a sack, uh, Jabril Peppers. And then Darnie Holmes, he only had one solo tackle, but I forgot to mention this stat last week. He's the only r- rookie cornerback with 15 or more targets to not allow a touchdown this season. And, and that continued against the Eagles game. So that was before the Eagles game, 39 targets. And I think he had a bunch more targets against the Eagles and still has not allowed a touchdown. So that's something to, to put on your mantle. And then, um, you know, Dalvin Tomlinson, the run stuffer, only one assist, no solos, but clogging up lanes. Graham Gano, two for two, long of 44. 100% on extra points. Um, you know, I, I keep expecting him to have his miss, you know, because that's kind of how it works. Like right when you right when you don't need a miss, you know, it's never like the first drive. It's always like close ball game, you know, and the guy's been perfect all year, and it's like this is the one that we really, 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 really need, and they miss it, and, and uh, he came through both times. And uh, he signed a three-year extension, 14 mil, I think it was. And you're like, Graham Gano, he's going to go, gonna go to the Pro Bowl. He signed him to an extension. He's looking great. And then he gets COVID. <laughs> it's like, thank God we have a bye week. Because I, I did not know what our backup plan was. I, I, almost put, I almost tweeted out, like, all gas, no field goals, no extra points. It's just going to be Madden style. We're going to go for two every time. We're going <laughs> to we're gonna go for, go for it on fourth down every time in enemy territory. Like, it's just going to be like high school football, basically. But apparently, we've had this dude on our practice squad, Ryan Santoso. Uh, Joe Judge expressed confidence in Ryan Santoso if Gano isn't ready for the Bengals game, which he... It's tough. It's going to be tight because I think they announced the extension either Sunday after the game maybe or Monday and then like Monday or Tuesday they were like yeah he's got COVID so there's going to be you know typically you'd have to 14 days of quarantine but this is like professional sports multi-billion dollar organization so they're like well if you we're just going to test the shit out of you and if you have a bunch of negative tests in a row then you're good to go it's like all right wish I could do that um so Santoso if Cano if Cano can't go We'll have Ryan Santoso. Dude is 6'5", 258 pounds. <laughs> we have like a tight end on the practice squad who's like smaller than that. Uh, he's an undrafted free agent out of Minnesota, University of Minnesota, Golden Gophers. And uh, he was a kicker, freshman, sophomore year in college, and then became a punter junior and senior year. So it's kind of like, mm, and now he's a kicker again? What's going on? He became Minnesota's kicker in 2014 and had a poor 12 of 18, so two-thirds uh, success rate for field goals, um, but went 45, 46 in extra points. Of course, the extra points in college, not the same as NFL. High point of his season then was a 52-yard field goal to beat Purdue. 2015, his field goal numbers improved, 17 of 21, which is around 81%. And a game-winning field goal in overtime against Colorado State. 
perfect th- 32 for 32 and extra points. And then he became a punter. So it's like, okay. And he averaged, he had the fourth best average in school history, punting. 46 punts inside the 20, with a career long of 68 yards. So I watched, uh, he spent, he was signed by the Lions and waived. Didn't see any time. Went to the Alouettes, signed to the practice squad. Didn't see any kicks. I guess maybe he's a punter on the practice roster. Went to the Titans and was a kickoff specialist in three games in 2019 last year. And then went back to the Alouettes, but the Alouettes season was canceled. So, but Joe Judge must see something in him. And I would have think that gold, like, uh, Carter Coughlin might have something to say about this since he was a, he was at Minnesota at the same time as Santoso. Maybe, you know, I don't know if Chris Williamson is on the practice squad still, but he was a golden gopher. So maybe he said he could vouch for Santoso kind of odd that he's moved to punter in college, but maybe that, maybe that's like the coaching staff in college, just not seeing his potential or not being able to coach him up. I watched his pro day from 2018 on YouTube Dude is a strong leg. He is not accurate, though. Looked like he was drawing. I mean, this was in a bubble, indoors, on the turf. And he was kind of hooking a lot. Hooking, hooking, hooking. I think he hit one uh, to the right, missing. So he's not incredibly accurate, but goddamn, he has a strong leg. (laughs) He was hitting from 60-plus yards, no problem. Yeah, and yeah. On turf, indoors, no pads, no rush, perfect hold because it's just the little T thing. So I get it. But it's a little encouraging to see, you know, that if we get into that situation where it's a 50-plus yard field goal, that Judge would have confidence in him to to put it through. Riley Dixon, four points with a 53.3 average, and that's due to his long of 71. Four punts inside the 20. Now, Gano, I got to think, has got to be guaranteed pro bowler. He's like leading the league in field goals made. Riley Dixon should be a pro bowler. I mean, the, the number of punts he's put inside the 20. Every single punt he had on Sunday was inside the 20. And that 71-yard punt was, I don't want to say a game changer, but goddamn, definitely helped us out a lot to boom the ball and to get inside the 20 when we were back up, we were not like close to midfield. I mean, this is something he had to put a lot of effort into it. And the fact that you can, you can launch a rocket like that and still have it come down inside the 20. Just amazing. Uh, Jabril Peppers, yet another game returning punts should have had a touchdown and judge broke this down. The judge report. You know, he had a choice, just like Dion Lewis had a choice, I guess, against the Redskins the previous week, where it's like he could have cut it outside, and he probably would have scored, but he decided to kind of cut it up and go vertical, and he ended up running into Cam Brown, who probably was not expecting to get his ass rammed in by Jabril Peppers, but still a good, you know, 20-yard return that put us in really good uh, scoring opportunity. I think we got a field goal out of it, but... God damn, I would love to see Peppers return a nice kick for a touchdown, A. But B, I'd like to see one of these deep kicks that get into enemy territory result in six instead of three. Wentz was 21 of 37, 208, no touchdowns, no picks. And this is where it gets weird. You look at the stat line, you're like, man, we got gashed. Miles Sanders, 15 carries, 85 yards, 5.7 yard average. Boston Scott, three carries, 63 yards, and a touchdown. The 21 yard average. Now, Boston Scott had that one long run for a touchdown. I forget how long it was. It might have been 50 or more yards. So it's like you have one big play that kind of throws all your averages off. But you look at those numbers and you say to yourself, Jesus Christ, Philly, why didn't you run the ball? <laughs> why don't you just, like, it seems like, what is it, 19, 21, 23 designed carries, and four of them went to, quarterbacks and that's that's what I think is most important here is that Wentz two carries four yards like we were not we we didn't allow him to get loose and to scramble and to pick up big chunks with his legs and then the what Philly is doing with Jalen Hurts I'm not really I don't really understand like very important 
second down or third down on a drive you need to have and you throw Hertz in there and it's like a design run that the Giants sniffed out no problem. I don't know. That's a that's like a coaching thing. <laughs> and uh, you know, that the tweet of Doug Peterson on WIP, the Philly Sports Radio Station, where he's just like super pissed off and frustrated. And it's like, well, dude, a lot of the, the onus is kind of on you, my man. Like <laughs> You just didn't coach a good game. Like, why are you going for two? I think it was 20, what was it, 21-16, something like that? Or tw- I don't know. They had an opportunity to just kick the field goal and be, uh, kick the extra point and be within a field goal, and, just, and, and instead they go for two. Like, why? It would have been 21-18. Kick the extra point, dude. <laughs> and then you don't have to go for it the next go round on a fourth down instead of kicking the field goal. It's just like, I don't know. Very weird. Um, yet again, R- Richard Rodgers, which I don't know this dude really does much against anyone else except us, but five targets, four catches, 60 yards. Jalen Rieger, seven targets, four catches, 47 yards. Greg Ward, six targets, five catches, 39 yards. Dallas Goddard, six targets, four catches, 33 yards. Boston Scott, only one catch, 11 yards. Love to see it. We finally, I mean, he still killed us on that long run for a touchdown. I was like, here we go again. Boston Scott is just going to go off on us. But after that long run, I don't think he did much. But these are the big ones. Travis Fulgham, who everyone was fellating the whole week. Like, this guy came out of nowhere. He's one of the league's best. Five targets, one catch, eight yards. (laughs) <laughs> that is, I mean, that's perfection right there. That's just that's sweet. It tastes great. Less filling. Love that. Took his ass away. Not going to let him kill us. And then Alshon Jeffrey came back and he had one target, no catches. <laughs> I don't know why I was like worried about Alshon Jeffrey. I just think he's probably, he's probably <laughs> Dunyans. Wentz had two fumbles. Hertz had a fumble, but uh, we were unable to recover it. And I only bring that up because it's just nice to see that we're forcing fumbles. <laughs> you know, uh, even though we're still not we're not getting on them, the fact that we're still forcing them, you keep forcing them, good things are going to happen. So, uh, yeah. So the, the Eagles' defense. Um, there are times where they just look ferocious sometimes where it's just like whoa some plays are just like this this defense looks impenetrable um Derek Barnett with the sack and and, uh Fletcher Cox with a sack Javon Hargrave and Vinny Curry combining for a sack and but then you see like we're able to run the ball with fairly with ease and there are times where Jones is able to stay in the pocket and, and progress through his reads. So um, just all around great team effort. Our biggest win of the season, and like I said, it's probably one of the biggest wins of the past 17, 18, four, four seasons, I'd have to say. 17, 18, 19, 20. Biggest win since 2016. Believe it. So happy, dude. And I really do think there's going to be a reversal of fortune here. I really do think, even though momentum's not a thing, according to Joe Judge, you take this win and you say to yourself, we did it. We got over the hump. And now we can go in the bye week and we can prep our dicks off for the Bengals and stick it to them. And we're going to get people back. One of those people we're going to get back, O'Shane Ziminez. Tay Crowder's another guy, but O'Shane Ziminez. Through the first five weeks of the season, he saw 33% of defensive snaps, but was tied for second in QB hits, tied for second in pressures, and first in QB knockdowns. So he's, okay, so not getting sacks, but much like uh, Leonard Williams last year, a lot of hits, a lot of pressures, a lot of knockdowns, and you keep working at it, and those are going to turn into sacks. So um, my guess is he'll primarily be a pass rush specialist. (laughs) Maybe you see, uh, you know, third down, Long situations, you see him and Carter Coughlin and Cam Brown 
and just a bunch of like just hungry, fast wolves just getting after it. You know, not necessarily NASCAR, but more like F1. <laughs> um, so that's great. Uh, projected to get 70 to 80% of snaps. I don't know. I, I guess maybe because, I mean, look who we got going now, Trent Harris and Jabal Sheard, who are just kind of new to the to the scene. So, you know, without Zoe, without Golden, he should see more time. All charges against DeAndre Baker have been dropped. Um, that's got to be one of the wildest stories I've ever I've ever heard and I've ever experienced. It's just like, what the fuck actually happened? Like, can someone just tell the goddamn truth? <laughs> like, these witnesses have, like, gone on the record and recanted and gone on the record and recanted and gone on the record and recanted a bajillion times. And it would just be nice to get the truth. And, of course, like, Judge is like, we've moved on. No comment on Baker. We caught him. We released him. And the Chiefs are expected to sign him to the practice squad. So, of course, he'll probably make to the active roster and become a perennial pro bowler. That's just how it goes. Um, we talked a little bit, we hinted at this earlier on, but the pro bowl voting is now open. Make sure you get your votes in for the pro bowl. Word is it's not going to be an uh, in-person game. It's going to be like a virtual Madden competition, which doesn't sound that bad. It might be actually cooler than watching them just grab ass all the time. Which Giants deserve to be Pro Bowlers? We talked about Graham Gano. He's got to be automatically in. I think James Bradbury gets the, gets the nod. I think Blake Martinez definitely is a Pro Bowler. He's like leads. Uh, if he doesn't lead the t the league in tackles, he's probably top five. And then there were a couple players that I thought deserve a look and deserve serious consideration of the four that I have on my kind of borderline list Riley Dixon is probably the favorite to also get selected just given like how proficient he is placing balls inside the 20 I would say next up would be Leonard Williams given that you know the main knock on him was his inability to get sacks and he's been getting sacks you know five or six through nine ten weeks and uh has a pretty decent high PFF grade I think it's like 70 something 77 maybe 71 and then the other two are, are, are kind of long shots, and I, I don't expect them to be selected, um, especially since I don't think anyone's going to be – well, maybe they still would opt out. Like, would you still opt out if it's a video game competition and you're in the playoffs? Probably, right? But um, Logan Ryan and Jabril Peppers. <laughs> and I know, uh, you know, you look at their PFF grades, it's nothing special. You look at, like, their actual rankings at their position – Nothing too crazy, but I just think they've done such a, a great job this year that um, I wouldn't be surprised. So um, I'll speak a little bit about how crazy this fucking division is, the NFC East. Oh, my Lord. Uh, Paul Schwartz had put out a an article that didn't really reveal a whole lot, but um, the title was Why the Giants NFC East Title Isn't So Crazy. And he, he didn't really, I mean, there's nothing, the, New York Post is just like, they're very well known for having catchy titles and headlines. And then the substance in the article is just like, this is what, you didn't tell me why it isn't so crazy. Like, <laughs> he could have boiled it down to a sentence, I guess. But 6 and 10 can win the division. We said it earlier on in the episode, 6 and 10 can win the division. And that would, that would send the National Football League into a fucking tizzy to have that happen because we all went nuts when the Seahawks went seven and nine in 2010 or was it 2011? 2010 or 2011? I think it was 2010 and they uh, hosted the playoff game against the Saints and that's when we had Beastquake to go six and ten. So we're three and seven now to go six and ten. We'd have to go three and three down to stretch, which very realistic. I think, I think we get a win against the Bengals. We'll probably get a win against the Cowboys in the finale. And then we would need one more win. And that one more win would have to come against, uh, well, we'll get into it a little bit, but I looked at philipplayoffstatus.com. It's one of my favorite websites. I've been going to it 
probably every year since I don't know when. 08, 09 maybe. And it has not been updated <laughs> in that time. It's the same exact website. You know, it serves its purpose. It's like Wikipedia. They should ask for donations. They really should. Uh, Giants have a 21% chance to win the East, which that's significantly up from like, what was it, 5% to make the playoffs before? Cowboys are at 20%, and the Eagles are at 48% to win the East. Philly has the fourth toughest schedule in the league, second hardest in the conference, and the most difficult in the division. So I'd say if anyone crumbles, it could be the Eagles. They have to. They have the uh, away game with the Browns this week. Who knows how that turns out? I mean, the Browns have an amazing run game. Their defense is pretty is pretty sturdy. You know, after that big loss to the Ravens, I think in the opener, they've been pretty solid ever since. So, even though they don't have OBJ and you know Anjoku wants a trade and all that, which I guess he denied maybe. Um, that's going to be a tough one. Home against the Seahawks, so I, I would I would feel better about you know Philly losing if it were in Seattle, but uh, that's a Monday night game. That should be uh, that's must watch TV. At the Packers in Green Bay, so that's probably a loss. Home against the Saints, which the Saints are a different ball team away than they are at home. And Drew Brees, who knows where he is with the injury. So I think they said broken ribs and a collapsed lung, which that's not, you don't bounce back from that. And Jameis Winston, how is he going to play? We'll find out this week against the Falcons. So maybe they do pull off wins against the Seahawks and Saints. I think they lose to the Browns and Packers. And then they have the at Arizona. So I think that could be a loss as well. Because the Phillies not doesn't play as well away as they do at home. So you're looking at two wins against three losses in their next five. They could very well lose the next five, and, and that would put them at three, ten, and one. And uh if they finish at five, ten, and one, six and ten for us will give us the division. Now the issue is with the Cowboy, uh, oddly enough. You know, people have discredited and counted out the Cowboys and the Washington football team, and I think that's that's a mistake. And I know things look pretty shitty for Dallas right now, but let's take a look. The Cowboys have the easiest schedule in the league. Now, I want to put easiest in quotes because after I read this off, you're going to be like, mm, I don't know about that. At the Vikings, I think that's a loss. Home against uh, Washington on Thanksgiving Day. They very rarely lose on Thanksgiving Day. and But they did lose to Washington earlier, even with Andy Dalton in the mix, 25-3. Would that be different on their home turf? That could be a loss. And then at Baltimore, that's a loss. That's the following Thursday. And then at Cincinnati, that could be a win. And then home against the 49ers. Who knows what state the 49ers are going to be in? I mean, they've got a lot of injuries. So, I mean, Dallas could be looking at five and nine with two games to play. And those two games would be the Eagles and Giants. So if they win those two, they're seven and nine, they win a division. But again, loss, potential loss, loss, potential win. So three losses, one win, maybe two, two and three. So yeah, maybe they are four and ten by the time they met they they face the Eagles and Giants. Now the Washington football team has the second easiest schedule in the division. They're home against the Bengals, which they could pull that off. At Dallas on Thanksgiving, at Pittsburgh, that's a loss. At San Francisco, who knows where San Fran is? That could be a loss. It could be a win. Home against the Seahawks, so. They're not in Seattle. That could be a game changer. And then they're home against Carolina. So they very well could be 6-9 and nine before they face the Eagles. And if they face the Eagles in the finale at 6-9 and nine and win 7-9, and nine, that puts, and we're 6-10, and 10, Washington gets the, even though we own the tiebreaker, Washington has the better record, and so they would get the division crown. <laughs> I mean, who knows? They should have beat, I mean, I think they should have beat the Lions this past week and just crumbled last minute. And the Lions are... You know, the Lions are the Lions, but they do give people a fucking fight every week. Giants have the sixth toughest road ahead in the conference. 
at Cincy, I got that as a win. At Seattle, I have that as a loss because I just think it's in Seattle. Sh- crazy shit happens there, and it usually goes Seattle's favor. And then home against Arizona, I think because this is a home game, I have it as a win. And then we have a home game in since Browns. I think that could be a win. And then I have us at Baltimore, but losing in Baltimore just because it's just, yeah, no thanks. So, so we have three wins, two losses. We could be at six and nine heading into the Cowboys game. And that means, you know, hopefully we could pull out the win there and go to seven and nine. Because uh, we would own the tiebreaker against the Washington football team. So say we go seven and nine, Washington goes seven and nine, we own the tiebreaker. I think seven and nine is is definitely within reach. You know, although that's a that's a that's a murderous murderer's row, death row. C- Seattle, Arizona, Cleveland, Baltimore. Fortunately for us, Cardinals and Browns are at home. Uh, but playing in Seattle and in Baltimore. Oof. But, you know, Baltimore just lost to the Pats in New England. Didn't look great. Seahawks have not looked too great. I don't know how they're doing tonight. I haven't checked in. They were playing the Cardinals tonight, so I'd have to check in on on how that went down. You know, Cardinals... In Arizona, I think that would have been a little scarier, but yeah. Cleveland, I think it's going to be a slugfest. That's going to be like a 6-3 game. It's going to be like a 3-2 game in the bottom of the ninth. Like where I I was hoping that we would just put a fucking smackdown on Cleveland, you know, as uh, to finally put all the comparisons to rest about the OBJ trade and all that bullshit. Um but it's it's going to be like i'm expecting like injuries galore in that one it's just going to be people hurting each other so but no preview of the Bengals game this week instead we have a bye week and so i did a little did a little research did a little homework on the sweetest bye weeks since 1990 since that's uh i don't know i think that's the last that's when it was really implemented the bye week there were two bye weeks in 93, which they, they've they kind of dabbled with bringing that back. And, uh, I mean, I wouldn't be mad at it. Extending the football season? Fuck yeah. But here are the seven sweetest bye weeks since 1990. I'm going from uh, least to most sweetest, I guess you could say. There's seven of them here. We'll start with uh, the first one, and you're going to probably you know blink a little bit like that white dude in the meme. 2015, Okay. Now, we were 5-5 five and five when we went into the bye week, but we only lost by three to the Saints on that crazy, ridiculous, uh, you know, punt return with the penalty in the, in the last second field goal. I think the final score was 52-49. It was a hell of a shootout. Breeze versus Eli. Uh, we then blew out the Bucks and Jameis Winston, and then we lost to the Pats by one. If you remember, that was the game where Landon Collins had the game-ending interception in his hands, but he fell and hit the ground and the ball came loose. So we could have, you're looking at potentially beating the Saints and the Pats going into the bye. That would have been a three-game win streak, possibly longer. So we're looking at, we could have been seven and three at the break in 2015. Could have been seven and three. And uh, it's not to mention that we also lost by one to the Cowboys in the opener. So we could have very well been eight and two at the break, which would have been like, oh, I don't know how we, how we, we'd lose uh, momentum there. Um, after the break, we then lost the Jets in OT and the uh, eventual NFC champion Panthers by three. In an alternate reality, um, we go 11-5 and five in 2015. So it's amazing how, you know, 2015, 2016, one was whatever it was, 6-10, and 10, the other one was 11-5, and five, but... The, you know, the ball bounces a different way in each season and you're looking at a little reversal there. And maybe Coughlin doesn't get fired. If we go 11-5, he's definitely not getting fired. And then who knows how the franchise proceeds from there. Will we have, will we have McAdoo? Will we have Shermer? Will we have Joe Judge? Next sweetest bye week was 2004. We lost the opener to Philly bad, but then we won four straight. And we'd only win two more after the break. But five of those losses were by seven or fewer points. So 2004, 
you look back at the final record and you're like, ah, it was a lost season. Eli was growing, but a lot of close ball games and uh, we got off to a nice start and we made the switch when we didn't, I don't know. I think we made the switch at five and three or five and four. So we started at four and one and then we kind of, you know, Warner had the fumbling problem and everyone thought he was donezo and over the hill. And then he uh, led the Cardinals to the freaking Super Bowl. Next sweetest bye week was 1999. After starting two and three, we reeled off three. We reeled off three straight. We had a three point win over Dallas and we blew out the Saints. And then we had an overtime win against Philly. I believe that was the game that Strahan had the sack fumble return for the touchdown or the interception return for a touchdown in OT to win it. And then, uh, so we go in feeling pretty good about ourselves. I think Kent Graham was still the quarterback at that time. And then we would lose three straight after the bye. And then Kerry Collins took the reins. And I don't know that he fared that much better, but the offense looked a little bit better. And we finished, uh, I think we finished seven and nine that year, or eight and eight and missed the playoffs. Next, next up at number four, or I guess if you're counting down reverse. So that was seven, six, five. Yeah, this is four. It's the same either way. So at the fourth sweetest bye week, it was the 2000 season. We got off to a five and two start. We beat the Falcons and Cowboys before the break, then beat the Eagles and Browns coming out of the break. That was a Super Bowl season. 2010, so this is the third sweetest bye week, was in 2010. We started one and two, and then we went five straight, capped by a thriller in Big D. And uh, we were riding high, six and two at the break, thinking we got our shit in gear. And then uh, coming out of the break, we lost to John motherfucking Kitna at home my birthday weekend when I had turned 30. That was a real kick in the dick. <laughs> like, welcome to your 30s. The Giants still lose the backups. Uh, and that was also the year that um, we played the game that shall not be named against the Eagles at home when I thought we were going to the Super Bowl. And then it all came crashing down. The second sweetest bye week was 1997. They started the season one and three, but reeled off five straight wins to get to six and three, beating the Saints, Cowboys, Cardinals, Lions, and Bengals in overtime. And uh, I think one of those games, the Saints game maybe, Dave Brown was still the quarterback. I just saw like a highlight from Big Blue VCR on Twitter. <laughs> I was like, oh, shit, I forgot Dave Brown actually started a few games there before uh, Danny Cannell <laughs> took over. <sighs> I mean, guys, you think Daniel Jones is not the answer? You did not live through Dave Brown, Danny Cannell, Kent Graham. You just didn't. <laughs> uh, and then the sweetest bye week of all time. Oh, so in 97, after the break, we ended up going 10-5-1 and one that season. So you start off 6-3, and three, and then we ended up losing. We ended up going 4-2-1 uh, and one down the stretch. So not, mm, not as good as the pre-bye week. Oh, but... Yeah, that tie was so funny against Gus Farad, I think it was, and Skins. But, uh, yeah, there was, a, there was like one or two losses in the second half. They were just like, huh? Anyway, the sweetest bye week had to be in 2007. When we started 0-2, and, and we looked like we were just, uh, people were writing us off left and right. We were in the, it was just a dumpster fire. Our defense couldn't stop anyone. We won six straight and we capped it off with a three-point win over the Miami Dolphins in London where Eli Manning rushed for a touchdown. That's back when quarterbacks, Giants quarterbacks didn't rush for touchdowns. <laughs> and now it seems to be happening every other week with uh, Danny Dimes. But we would go four and four down the stretch after the bye. Three of those losses were by double digits. One to the Cowboys, I think that was right after the bye. One to the Vikings was like 41-17 to 17 when, when Manning threw like five picks, one – one or two for pick sixes. And then we, we just lost to like the, the skins at home by 12 points to like, I, I can't even remember the, the dude's name. Rex Grossman was in 2011, but this was like, I can't even remember the dude's name. He was number 10 and we just couldn't move the ball. I think Shockey, that's the game that Shockey went down 
that was Shockey's last game with the Giants because he was hurt for the rest of the season into the playoffs through the Super Bowl, and then he was traded in the, uh, during the 08 draft to the Saints. Whew. So those are the seven sweetest bye weeks since 1990. All right, we'll quickly, we'll try to quickly go through the Mets. I kind of had a lot of shit here, but I'm going to quickly go through it. Um, big news right off the bat, Robbie Cano. Suspended for 2021 season for performance enhancing drugs, PEDs. It's his second offense. So he's gone for all 162. Uh, he will uh, forfeit his $24 million in salary. And uh, although I guess fans that are not baseball fans that are outside that are not Mets fans are probably looking and going, oh man, sucks. Unreal. Can't believe it. Sucks for you guys. It's like, meh. It's actually a blessing in disguise. And I tweeted this out, but my conspiracy brain thinks that, you know, Steve Cohen is a billionaire. He probably knows a lot of people, probably has a lot of connections, and he probably has the money to make things happen. So I wouldn't be surprised if he just slipped a little something in Robbie Cano's protein shake to be like, get this motherfucker off the field and out of the dugout and get his salary off the book so we can put it towards players that are actually going to make a difference and clear up the log jam that is our goddamn infield. Uh, so yeah, I mean, how does this affect the Mets? Well, more money to go to free agents, you know, more money under the, more money they can spend towards the luxury tax, pass the luxury tax, whatever it is. And now as a, you know, you're looking at possibly not missing out on a free agent that you was one of your targets. Now that's probably more of reality. So, uh, my preference, I want McNeil at second. I think maybe you put Jimenez at third if you're not able to trade for Arenado, which I'm not even completely sold on Arenado. But Springer in center, McCann behind the dish, you know, Nimmo in left, Lindor at short. You know, I just, I, I like that more than going after LeMahieu. And LeMahieu wants to stay with the Yankees. That's kind of, he's made that clear. He wants five years with the Yankees and the Yankees want to give him four but he's willing to take less money for the Yank to stay with the Yankees. Like, do you want LeMahieu at second, then McNeil at third, where it's like that's still not his natural position? Uh, I don't know. So I I think this is it's a good thing. Yeah, it's, I mean it sucks for Cano, but at the same time, Cano, like, what are you doing, dude? I mean, I know like you're trying to stay up with the times, you know, with the cool kids, but like, uh, you know. It's disappointing, and I feel like, uh, you know, there was that tweet where the one someone tweeted at Steve Cohen, like, "Hey, what are we gonna do with that extra money bullpen carts?" And he's like, "No, we're gonna put it there towards players. Bull, bullpen carts are not in the picture. <laughs> players first. And you know, there, I think Trevor Bauer's agent is like in love with Steve Cohen and everything that Steve Cohen is saying. Bauer's mentioned how much he appreciates Steve Cohen's uh, disposition towards players." And his player first mentality. So, uh, you know, I would not, I was kind of out on Bauer because I figured he used, he's entertaining too many folks and he's, he's, the Mets are not his number one destination, but I think that's changed since Cohen has been introduced and everything that he's put out there so far on Twitter. So, uh, we're in a good spot. And it's, it's like, it's weird as a Mets fan. You're just expecting the other shoe to drop and something bad to happen, but it's, everything is turning up roses right now you know one agent that's been in contact with the Mets said that communication is already a huge difference from the previous regime and I believe it because you I mean I don't even know if we're going to get to this there's the five worst moments during the Wilpon era um I don't know if we'll have time to get to it probably not I'll probably get to it next week but you know it's just the shit that the Wilpons would say about their players <laughs> it's like and it's just a lot of it's kind of unwarranted. Um, and even if you do think that, don't put it in the press. And it was all and it was all really a ploy to to pay the players less. You know, it's another penny pinching maneuver. Drive down the market and drive down the cost. The Mets have shown interest and have been in touch with Charlie Morton's agent. We mentioned that Charlie Morton was kind of an under the radar um you know, ever since the Rays did not pick up his option for 21, 
that he could be a nice fifth starter. He's going to be 37, he's, but he's a Flemington, New Jersey native. And so that there might be some ties there to the Mets organization and uh, wouldn't hurt to get him in the mix. Mets have also shown agent, uh, interest in free agent pitcher Jake Odorizzi. And now we mentioned this last week that Odorizzi and Brad Hand were some of the predictions uh, for the offseason for the Mets, you know, bringing them in. Mets pitching coach Jeremy Hefner worked with Odorizzi in Minnesota, so there's a connection there. Um, and this also from John Morosi. He said that sources say Ray's highly regarded executive Bobby Heck is under consideration for a top front office role with the Mets since he is not the Tampa Bay GM. He likely would be permitted to leave for a GM role or hire in New York. Morosi also reported that the Mets requested permission to speak with Indians GM Mike Chernoff about their president of baseball operations position that we mentioned that last week, Michael Hill, I think it was, interviewed for. Um, but it's not clear if the Indians granted that interview. Um, the Mets are a suitor for Francisco Lindor. So are you looking at a combination of Chernoff and Heck to get the, the Mets train back on track? And this is this kind of threw me for a loop. And I'm not, I was kind of like, hmm? It was like that meme of that girl who's like, huh? Mm -hmm. Like, yes, no, yes, maybe. Um, the Mets are expressing, this is from Ken Davidoff. The Mets are expressing expressing interest in free agent Marcelo Zuna. So the Braves, he signed a one-year deal with the Braves for $18 million and went 338, 431, 636 in 60 games, 18 homers, 56 RBIs, 145 total bases, led the National League. Ooh, along with his 267 plate appearances. Uh, but he spent most of his time at DH. And then he would also play a little bit in left field and then just a little bit in right field. So he's not a center fielder, or at least he hasn't played there in a while. I don't think he could keep up. And we pretty much would, like, the. I mean, we're going to, if we don't trade Nemo, which I, I don't think we should trade Nemo, I believe Nemo belongs in left. And Conforto is obviously solidified in right. So it's like if there's no DH, which they're, I guess they're negotiating the player's agreement, something, collective bargaining agreement about having the DH for 21. If the DH is out, that really, I, I think that pretty much eliminates Ozuna. Unless we trade Nemo in that, uh, for the Lindor, in the Lindor trade. Uh, Yeah, so I I don't see us going after Azuna. Uh, that seems to be like the the, la the like the fallback of the fallback plan. If he doesn't sign somewhere else, I mean, it, it's like you gotta wait for all the other chips to fall. I guess he's not our number one option. Um, uh, I guess I'll. Uh, I guess we could quickly run through the <laughs> five worst memories during the Wilpon era. This is from Michael Carbalera. I think this is from Rising Apple. The Bernie Madoff scandal, which this pretty much affected how all things would, would roll out over the, the Wilpon's ownership tenure, really, if you think about it. all It all comes back to and tied to this fucking scandal. Uh, largest Ponzi scheme in history. Pleaded, he arrested in 08, pleaded guilty in 09. Mets were coming off back-to-back -back collapses in 07 and 08. And in 2012, Fred Wilpon reached a settlement where he had to pay back up to $162 million that he received from Madoff during the scandal. And MLB eventually even gave him the Wilpons a loan, which they definitely, for sure, did not use towards players. <laughs> in 2011, Fred Wilpon had some harsh criticism on three of his players. That We talked about this just uh I teased it a little bit before in New York Magazine. The guy who interviewed him, Jeffrey Tubin, is the guy who got fucking canned for masturbating on Zoom. I mean, what a world. So he he said this, Wilpon said this about Jose Reyes. He thinks he's going to get Carl Crawford money, who Carl forgot a big deal. He said uh, Reyes has had everything wrong with him. He won't get it. Yikes. David Wright, and, he, and Reyes didn't get it, even though he won the friggin' batting title in, in 11. He went to the Blue Jays. So uh, David Wright, he called him a really good kid, a very good player, not a superstar. I mean, and this is 2011. 
Yeah, I mean, David Wright's decline started in 09. That's when the injuries really started. So I guess he was super bitter about that. But had it not been for the injuries, Wright is a superstar. He was putting up superstar numbers from 2005 to 2008, pretty much. Four-year span. Um, and then he said this about Beltron. So our three top players, basically, in 2011, Reyes, Wright, Beltron. We had some schmuck in New York who paid him based on that one series. He's 65 to 70% of what he was. Okay. He, <laughs> Beltron also went on to play 11, uh, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, seven, six more years. <laughs> After that, he won a World Series with the Astros and uh, also went to the playoffs a couple times with the Cardinals. No big deal. And he technically had the, the, no hit hit against Johan. Uh, another worst moment in Wilpon history. They forced injured an injured Pedro Martinez to pitch against the Marlins in September of 05 in a fairly meaningless game. And that apparently that lingered on into 06, which uh, sucked because we really needed him down the stretch. We had freaking Ali Perez and John Main, and <laughs> like our starting pitching was lacking in the 06 postseason. Um, when City Field was built, seems like kind of like whatever, but I guess the Wilpons were big Brooklyn Dodgers fans. And so there was like absolutely zero Mets history in the new City Field, which is just egregious. I mean, they had the check, the tribute to Jackie Robinson right in the rotunda there in the front, but there was nothing to indicate that there was any kind of you know, Mets lore. And eventually they fixed it, but it took a, like a lot of like lashing out and uh, backlash from the fans before they actually got their asses in gear. And then the uh, the biggest mistake of the Wilpon era, or the worst moment of Wils the Wilpon era, was uh, Bobby Bonilla, the Bobby Bonilla deal. The deal was to defer his last payment for a decade because he was, uh, they wanted to buy him out, I guess, and after the 2000 season. So they deferred uh, the last payment for a decade. So it started in 2011, this new restructured deal. The Mets would pay him an annual payment of $1.19 million every July 1st. And so after July of 2035, which we're only 15 years away from, holy shit, Bonilla will have made just under $30 million for a year in which he did not even play in a Mets uniform. Mm. It was reported that Fred Wilpon accepted this deal mainly because he was heavily invested in Bertie Madoff's Ponzi scheme. The 10% returns he was supposed to get from Madoff was better than the 8% interest that he, they would have owed Bonilla on his buyout. <laughs> Bernie fucking made off crazy just not so so yeah I have a there was another couple sessions there was a one more feature I wanted to get to but I don't think I, we're gonna have enough time I will end with this I don't know if anyone saw this but Jared Hughes the mad dog had a Twitter thread in which he talked about how he he, in high school, went to bed without brushing his teeth, got hungry in the middle of the night, got up, went and had a bagel. Ate the bagel, went back to sleep, didn't brush his teeth, and thought he was drooling all night and kept wiping away drool and kept waking up and wiping away drool. And the drooling was not drool. It was ants marching in and out of his mouth to retrieve the bagel from his teeth. Ah, good God. Jared Hughes. <laughs> what a loony. Mad dog. Oh, boy. So, all right, that's the show. I had to stop and start this fucking show. I can't tell you how many times. Four times? Five times? There's a lot of stuff going on. And we're just going to, we're going to slip in just under, right before midnight. Um, Yeah. The plans for this week, for Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is canceled, apparently. Sucks. People want to do a virtual Thanksgiving. Maybe that could work. I don't know. But I'm going to go dark next week. I don't even know if I'm going to be able to do a Bengals preview. I'll, here's a preview. It's a win. Book it, Dano. Um, also have a new opportunity starting up the week after. So we're going to have a lot of updates in two weeks, probably. But no preview for the Bengals. All I know is I'm sick of all the hype and praise around Joe Burrow. We're going to shut Joe Burrow down. 
and everyone who said Joe Burrow is better than Daniel Jones, take a seat. All right. So no show next week, most likely. And then we're going to come back with a vengeance two weeks from now, hopefully, with all kinds of updates. So stay tuned. Thank you for listening. Uh, and we'll see you next we'll, well, no, we won't see you next week. We'll talk to you in a little bit. Two weeks, probably. Adios, muchachos.